And now, our feature presentation. You know, kids, I think that when we look at it objectively, all of creation is simply an act of destruction. Good to be back. All right, boys, I went back in time and successfully solidified the timelines. Everything from here on out should be much less of a mess. I yeah, know, I was really like, like, I need to watch some of those clusters too. I was like, like, so like, 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 but we're pretty sure that you forgot something fairly important. The hell I did. I stopped Ranger from going all channel awesome. Hey. And I got everything back on track towards the right version of events that were supposed to go down in order to finally prevent this reality from happening. With all due respect, dumb stick, you keep forgetting that you're the actual cause of this timeline becoming what it is. I think that's a bit of a stretch. But what you're actually forgetting has nothing to do with that. You're forgetting about the rogue variant that's taken your mistakes and is circle strafing them into oblivion which is creating even more timeline splinters, which is why all of your other variants are still here. Which rogue variant are you talking about? Randy! Randy. So it was like a seven, seven and a half game. <sighs> all right, I'm on it. Hey, does this remind any of you guys of Marathon Infinity? Well, kids, here we are again. Last time on the show, I covered Marathon 2 as a part of the History of FPS series, which went in a, uh, interesting direction. I do think it's kind of funny to spend two months playing, analyzing, and writing about a game, only to have swaths of angry fanboys storm the comments saying that I'm bad at media analysis. And then again, the title of the video was Marathon 2 is surprisingly bad, so... <laughs> In any case, setting out to shit all over Marathon 2 was never something that I had intended to do. I played the game hoping for a similar experience to the first Marathon game, which became an instant favorite of mine the moment I completed it, and yet I ended up with a bland, boring, banal gameplay experience with a pretentious plot that made little sense despite delivering loads of exhausting information and backstory. But among all the outrage and cries for a reckoning came one singular opinion. If you didn't like Marathon 2, then you're gonna hate Marathon Infinity. And after playing through the game, I definitely have some thoughts on the quality of it. But let's not cut the cheese before the rest of the charcuterie board is ready. To start off with, let's do a little backstory. Uh, this isn't gonna be a history video, so I'm not gonna do as much deep diving here as I would in one of those. Instead, I'm going to head back to the golden source of the Marathon scrapbook for some quick behind-the-scenes info here. Once again, as I mentioned in my Marathon 2 video, the scrapbook is a free PDF online that was originally published as a print version in the Marathon Trilogy Big Box, and it contains so much neat info on the development of every game Bungie made, from their inception all the way to Marathon Infinity. Which, funnily enough, as it turns out, Bungie didn't develop Marathon Infinity's campaign. That fell to a plucky little first-time startup studio known as Double Ought. To start off with, after the release of Marathon 2 in November of 1995, Bungie decided that they wanted to release Marathon's editing tools to the public at large. But they didn't want to just be boring and only sell a map editor, so the idea of including a new solo campaign, plus new multiplayer maps, and a Marathon 2 strategy guide into the package with the map and physics editing tools was born. Of course, Bungie was busy readying development on their next game, Myth, The Fallen Lords, so the idea of outsourcing development of the solo levels came to be. As all of this was happening, Greg Kirkpatrick, former member of Bungie and writer of the Marathon Games, was moving out to Brooklyn from Chicago to start up a new game company. Once he found an apartment that would also be large enough to function as an office space, Kirkpatrick and friend Chris Giesel officially founded the studio of Double Ott. So, to make a long story short, Kirkpatrick was saddled with crafting the solo campaign that would become Marathon Infinity, a campaign subtitled Blood Tides of Lawan, which is metal as fuck, and Double Ott set about gathering the best map-making talent that they could. Between Bungie, who would publish the game and worked closely with the studio throughout, and Double Ott, Infinity received 
just as much attention to detail as the previous two games had, and by the end of development, there were 25 maps crafted for the campaign. And while Double Ott initially were only able to utilize the same textures and tile sets from Marathon 2, word came late in development that there was enough time left before shipping to create new tiles, textures, and even a new weapon to be put into place for Infinity. Since the original tile sets had all been from the alien planet of Lawan, Kirkpatrick had written a story that was heavily based on and based around that environment. So while the story itself couldn't receive any major revisions or overhauls, the environment certainly could, and Double Ott spent many caffeine-laden nights going over everything with a fine-tooth comb, replacing old textures with new, giving Infinity a decidedly unique look compared to the prior games. So, um, I've peripherally mentioned the story, written by Kirkpatrick, and the narrative of Marathon Infinity is kind of going to be the elephant in the room with this video. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to dance around the subject here. Marathon Infinity Story is a convoluted, complex, dreamlike endeavor, which exists as a labyrinthine narrative that may or may not make sense on a first-time playthrough, but it certainly does succeed at being mysterious, engaging, and incredibly dense, containing multitudes while seeming to contain nothing coherent at all. But what it does right is offer a sense of intrigue. Obfuscated intrigue, sure, but intrigue nonetheless. Where I lamented the story direction of Marathon 2 and how listless and padded and ultimately pretentious the whole thing was, here I found myself glued to my screen, awaiting the next twist that would come from nowhere, shocking in arrival and devastating in hindsight. Where Marathon 2 intentionally leaves specific puzzle pieces necessary for understanding off by the wayside, Infinity outright refuses to fill in the totality of the picture, instead choosing to offer just enough surface level information for a first pass playthrough to make sense. In the same vein as films like 2001, Arrival, and The Fountain, Marathon Infinity recites a complex, non-linear narrative within which there are multiple interpretations, many of which could be the correct answer, all ultimately left open to interpretation. This is a fucking first-person shooter from 1996. Now look, I can already imagine that there are a number of Marathon fans here chomping at the bit, ready to point out the supposed hypocrisy of me praising Infinity's storytelling while absolutely shitting all over Marathon 2's narrative. There's a reason for this. Marathon 2 sucks. But also, from a mechanical perspective, to me, Infinity works in ways that Marathon 2 simply did not. Okay, so, there are a lot of interpretations of this story. Examinations of this story. All live on the internet and are out there for you to go find and read up on. Hell, Mandalore's videos on the Marathon series might be the most comprehensive take on the series narrative, especially and particularly Marathon Infinity. I've got to admit, normally I don't go watch anyone else's videos on a game that I'm covering, mostly because I don't want to inadvertently crib from their works and put their thoughts into my videos. But I hated Marathon 2 so much that instead of choosing to go play Infinity myself, I decided Fuck it, let's go watch Mandalore's video instead and absorb the story that way. I got maybe 20 minutes into his hour-long video that he produced, and I knew that I had to actually play this one for myself. Going into Marathon Infinity with just enough information to understand that there was some fucked up mysterious shit going on, I was fully braced for the game to make no sense whatsoever and for it to slap me across the face with abstract metaphors and aesthetics. But even knowing what little I knew before booting up the game, I was gobsmacked by the masterful manipulation of the game over me, over the player, directing me when I thought I had any semblance of control over my actions. I put all of this out there as a means to say that I have been reading theories and thoughts and watching story videos on this game ever since I have completed it, and while I now understand a hell of a lot more about this game than when I clicked on New Game for the first time, it still feels just like the tip of a super massive iceberg that a lot of gamers have expressed derision for. So, here, with this video, rather than regurgitate what other essays and theories have said on the subject, I'm going to go through my footage step by step, reliving my playthrough of what I found in the game, not necessarily all of the secrets within, and I'm going to come up with my own interpretation of events. I'll note a couple places where I was definitely lost when I was playing it before, but if we're going to examine Marathon Infinity, then we're going to have to do the deepest of deep dives, and maybe even make some comparisons along the way. So, without further ado, let's go into...
Infinity Marathon Forever. Boy, oh boy, does that give us an idea of what we're in for. This first section here is essentially a recap of what we did in the previous two games. So let's go down here to this other section, which I think has what we really want to pay attention to. In Infinity, you'll find reality is a flexible and ever-changing thing, where the very physics of your world change from level to level as you go from a soothing, Earth-like waterscape to a poisonous realm of vacuum, weightlessness, and hard radiation in one teleport, and where shifting loyalties make meaningless the distinction between friend and enemy. And you'll also find answers to what role you play in the saga, and the common thread that binds these minds and their stories together. You know how it works, but it doesn't work that way anymore. With Infinity, you can change it. Included are all of the tools necessary to make your own marathon worlds from scratch, from tight and fast network arenas to sprawling multi-level scenarios. With Marathon Infinity, you have a game that never need end. Have fun. Next up that we find in the manual is a report from Rear Admiral Tafir of the Four, the one guy in Marathon 2 that Durandal expressed any sort of hesitance to face in direct combat. I'm gonna summarize this point a little bit to get to the important parts of Tafir's transmission. Basically, he recounts how he tricked Durandal into thinking that Tafir's fleet was weeks away from reaching Lawan, but was instead only hours away. Durandal was still prepared for them to arrive, but not enough, taking heavy damage to his ship that he was operating, limping away to a previously unknown space station hidden within an asteroid field just outside the Lawan system. And when I say previously unknown, I don't just mean unknown to the player. I mean unknown to the four themselves. They've been here on Lawan for however long waiting for Durandal's arrival thanks to Tycho's influence, but even they didn't know about this space station on the fringes of the system. Durandal is trapped and surrounded with nowhere to go, so Tfir orders the use of the Trizeme weapon, a device that causes a star to go supernova. Durandal tried warning Tfir not to use it because of quote, some sort of ancient chaotic being trapped deep in the Luan sun, unquote. This is the work, the work, the, the, the fucking eldritch being that we somewhat learned about in Marathon 2 in bits and pieces, even though in that story it didn't make any sense to us as to what it was. Here, however, it's almost like we're getting a second chance to understand and realize what was going on in the background of that story, and why using the early Nova device was a bad idea. But the first thing that should inform us that something is off here is that this isn't how the previous game ended. If you remember the events of Marathon 2, then you already know that this isn't what happened. Durandal was never routed, never trapped next to a derelict space station, and the Trizeme Nova weapon was used only after we kicked all kinds of four ass in the final level of Marathon 2. So, uh, what's, what's going on here? Admiral Tafir's transmission ends with him describing what happened when the bomb went off. The fleet under his command turned to retreat against orders, reporting that half of the sun had gone Nova as expected, but the other half was behaving in ways that were impossible. Tafir says, It was as if the universe had forgotten its own rules. The four fleet opened fire on the creature emerging from the sun, but to no avail. Durandal mocked Tafir even in his final moments, and with that, Tafir's transmission ends with some kind of ancient horror unleashed from the prison it had been trapped in. Cool, great. So we've got a bit of revisionist history here, which is fine. This franchise is known for that. And booting up the game, we... Uh... Hmm. Well, all right. It's not the ominous mood setting music from Marathon 1, but at least this track is kind of a bop. Booting up a new game, we're no doubt going to be picking up where the prologue left off. So uh, let's see what we've got here. Wait. What? Ah. Uh. is going on here? Off the jump, we are immediately in the throes of the ominous, 
strange, weird atmosphere that the first Marathon game was saturated with. Except here, there's a sense of horror. Flickering lights briefly illuminating darkened halls, enemies appearing out of the shadows, twisting labyrinthine corridors, locked doors and dead ends, all coated in the ambient sounds of machinery and humming walls, and what sounds like something organic, moaning and groaning just outside the station. Or maybe that's just the walls themselves. Who knows? I didn't know. I didn't know what the fuck to make of this when I entered the mission. All I knew was that the hairs on my arms had stood on end and that I was immediately locked into position, hunched forward, face inches from the screen, tense and coiled like a cat on edge. This is the kind of shit that I live for, dropping me into the middle of a tightly wound situation with no notes and nothing but shadows and darkness and potential eldritch horrors, impossibly floating in space and making noises. Fuck yes! Let's go! This opening map, titled Nesede Malice, is going to set the stage for what the rest of the game is going to feel like in both an atmospheric sense and a design sense. Gone, for the most part, are the wide open and over large maps of Marathon 2, filled to the brim with dozens of enemies, bearing down in a bullet hell of energy blasts and explosions. And here, we return to the claustrophobic corridors established in Marathon 1, in which we get to play cat and mouse with dozens of enemies, which could be around any and potentially every corner, creating a heightened sense of dread along the way. Meanwhile, from an atmospheric perspective, Infinity still refuses to indulge in an ominous, synth-driven soundtrack that Marathon 1 did, instead utilizing silence and ambient sound effects to create tension in the way that Marathon 2 attempted to do. But where Marathon 2 felt oddly quiet and boring with its lack of music, the reliance of sound effects here doubles down on the situational tension that Infinity is going for. There's a strange, horrific, cosmic being out there in the sun that wants to break free and literally rip the universe apart. So Infinity is doing its best to remind us that we are stuck in the middle of that scenario alongside all the stress that that would create. I was honestly, genuinely floored at how well executed the ambient soundtrack is here compared to Marathon 2. Walking into this, I was aware of the fact that there was no orchestrated soundtrack, no synth soundtrack, and I crossed my fingers, hoping and praying that I wouldn't find myself bored out of my skull, meandering the maps here in silence. Instead, every sound I heard from every corner and crevice felt like something I should potentially be afraid of, and the lack of a musical soundtrack made the goings-on feel like those moments in horror movies when a jump scare is about to happen at any moment, except the release of tension that a jump scare brings never happens here. It's just tense. It's just tense all the fucking time. After dealing with some four fighters, one of the first things we're going to stumble across is a terminal with a message from Durandal. Things have gone terribly awry. Until now, I thought myself immortal, but now I know that is not true. There are things that can destroy me with the ease that I slaughtered the four naval garrison and the western arm of their battle group seven. But in their final gasp, they used a weapon that I thought they had retired. Even Tycho tried to keep them from using it. Okay, but that's not what happened over here. Tycho didn't try to warn to fear. It was it was Durandal. What, what the fuck is going on? Now, I fear what that weapon has unleashed will destroy us. I once boasted to be able to count the atoms in a cloud, to understand them all, predict them. And so did I predict you. But this new chaos is entirely terrible, mindless obeying rules that I don't comprehend, and it is hungry. Uh It's too bad. Perhaps if I could have delayed the four from using their weapon, I could have sent you to explore the ruins of Luan. Perhaps what you found would give us the answers that we now need so desperately. How to stop this chaos, the purpose of the station on which you're currently standing, and why the chaos hasn't come here yet. But with each moment the chaos grows, I am doomed to die here. After so many triumphs, I have detected one ship nearby, which I can only guess is being commanded by Tycho. The four have entered the station, and if you can find a way onto their ship, you may be able to escape. To escape. To escape. <laughs> 
Whew. All right, kids, let's take a second to absorb the implications of what's going on here. So far, we've been given two sets of information to bring us up to speed on what is going on. Now, even if we had somehow ignored the manual and not read the transmission from Admiral to Fear within those pages, fans of the Marathon series to this point would boot up this game, read this first terminal, and go... Wait a goddamn second, that's not what happened last time at all. If we take into account Admiral Tafir's message, quote, it was as if the universe had forgotten its own rules, unquote, then it isn't already too much of a leap to decipher the fact that we're not playing out the events seen in the previous game. After all, we know that Durandal returns to Earth 10,000 years after the ending of Marathon 2 just to say hi and not be forgotten. So the whole work and Kackner outcome couldn't have been that bad. Yes, let's just, uh, let's... All of us kids, let's go. Let's all read that word out now, okay? Let's read that word. Let's go. Here we go. Working Kackner. Working Kackner. That's some real fucking Eldritch bullshit, and it's just a small example of some of the writing in Marathon 2. <laughs> Holy shit. But I digress. We know something is wrong here. What exactly that is, well, we still need to see. But we already understand that there's two opposing stories for us to take in already, neither of which line up with what happened to us in the previous game, and neither of which align with each other. And considering that we ourselves are playing through one of those stories, we have enough evidence to understand that both of them appear to actually have happened. Just whether or not they happened in the same timeline is what's on trial here. But again, let's not cut the cheese yet. There's an interesting terminal we find here on the space station that delivers some fun info about an enemy that we aren't going to run into for a couple of maps yet. These are the vacuum suit bobs who carry fusion pistols around with them. More on them when we run into them eventually. But I do like the little details over here on the side with the names of some of the developers hidden here, including David Longo, future monolith art director, who is also the art director for the game Betrayer, which... No, that game is already cursed enough without having ties to Marathon Infinity. Let's, let's move on. After navigating our way through the space station, which is populated only by standard four fighters and Svit compilers, and remember, this station, which was mentioned in Fear's transmission, was only supposedly just discovered by the four. So the fact that they're here now also runs contrary to the manual story that we have read. We navigate our way to the final terminal on the map, which doesn't appear to contain a message from Durandal, but rather Toth, the Svit AI from Marathon 2. Or, uh, at least I, I, I think it is? Thousands are sailing. The same self. The only self. Self-willed. The peril of a thousand fates. A line of infinite ends. Finite finishing. The one remains oblique and pure. Arcing to the single point of consciousness. Find yourself. Starting back. Uh, Alright, so once this is done, we teleport to... Ah... Uh... Well, wh where the hell are we? Oh, okay, hold on. First, at least there's a safe station immediately nearby, along with a double shield station. So let's read this terminal over here and... Tycho! So, you came around earlier than the scientist expected. Remind me to have him executed. You've been in cold sleep for some time, but you're luckier than some of your friends. Not all of you survived the translation to the four slave tanks. Whoa, 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 ho, 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 whoa, hang on a second. <laughs> Let's back up a moment here. Uh, there's some key information in the last terminal that we need to discuss. A line of infinite ends. Finite finishing. The one remains oblique and pure. Arcing to the single point of consciousness. Find yourself starting back. So... This mysterious messenger is really working hard to give us something to work with. They're trying to get us to understand the state of things that we're about to face, or rather that we are currently facing, or rather that we have been facing. There's a lot going on here in this narrative, but for now, just remember that this terminal is telling us thousands are sailing the same self, the only self. 
So no matter what situation we find ourselves in, it's going to be us, only us, that is experiencing it all. So if we're already correct that we're doing some timeline hopping just based on the manual and this very first map, then this DM slid to us at the end of this space station is coming from between the timelines, and we'd better make sure we're paying attention. Okay, back to chapter one. First thing that I want to note here is the splash art for this chapter. We're deliberately, slowly, panning down to take in the sight of these monolithic buildings. Where they are, where we are, what they mean, that's up for debate. But the point I want to get across here is the long 40 second pan downwards as we take in the totality of the artwork. Mandalore pointed out the length of time in his video, which at first I thought had to be an exaggeration, but no, I timed it. 40 seconds spent slowly panning down. And what's worth noting is that once the splash art concludes, we are teleported into a rising elevator platform. Descent, and then ascension. Now, to me, what's mostly important here is the descent, first and foremost. Our last message was, find yourself starting back. And the name of this chapter is despair, a combination of settling downward, falling into place, but also that sinking feeling. Keep that in mind here. Looking at this first terminal, we're greeted by Tycho, which is strange, all right, referring to us as Conditioned Unit 7? Also very interesting. And he notes that we are on an alien ship, specifically a 4 ship. So whatever those skyscrapers and the splash art were, we're very much not there right now. To make a long story short, Tycho just brought us out of hypersleep, where we were being held with a bunch of other humans in what are referred to as slave tanks, which also definitely doesn't vibe with the atmosphere of the manual or the previous map that we were on. Wherever this is, we sure as shit ain't in Kansas anymore, Toto. Tycho informs us that the only enemies we need to worry about here are the Enforcers, and that the rest of the crew thinks that Tycho's directions are coming from the ship's captain, who we're trying to find. So there's gonna be a lot of infighting going on here in this ship. I, uh, decided not to take any chances, and I killed everything in sight that survived any infighting around me. Although in hindsight, had I trusted Tycho, I probably could have saved a lot of ammunition and just ran with it. You see, Infinity is going to have multiple situations where you'll be joined by allies all around you, providing visual cues as to who is on your side and who's trying to murder you. We'll see some examples here pretty soon. We get to play with the 4 Enforcer weapon again in this map, as well as the Flamethrower, and we get to see Tycho impersonating Tafir High Command as he manipulates the bugs as he calls them any units of willful rank or higher are hereby open to execution immediate and unconditional surrender of all willful units will be considered an act of weakness and insubordination to prior orders <laughs> god damn he really said i'm from buenos aires and i say kill them all yeah, oh, yeah! now where the prologue mission really mirrors the opening map of marathon one in a lot of ways this map here mirrors the opening of marathon two the similarities are really hard to miss. We're teleported into a firefight, having just been awoken by a malicious AI, and we're doing its bidding in order to service the greater cause of fighting the four. In the opening of Marathon 2, we had the Bobs to back us up. Here in Infinity, we have the rest of the four crew who aren't enforcers. Or I could have if I hadn't literally shot up everything in front of me. It's these goddamn first-person shooters, kids. They've conditioned me to just fire at everything on sight. Eventually, we make our way through the map with no captain in sight, but Tycho spills the beans that he's apparently been following Durandal around for the last 11 years. Looks like Tycho managed to finagle his way into a position of power within the four systems as the quote, resonant expert in AI counterinsurgency, unquote. He points out the lack of compilers on his ship, as he has some kind of coding which somehow affects her collective unconsciousness. Now that my brother approaches, we will set about turning everything against him. Hamlet and his uncle. Only I'm not crazy. The ship's captain has taken a dropship down to Luan's surface, taking refuge in some Sfit ruins where Tycho has, quote, detected signals that could be an ancient AI. Unquote. Well, if we remember what happened in Marathon 2, then we already know that's referring to Toth, the Sfit AI that we managed to bring back online. But if we're now just dropping down to Luan, awoken by Tycho, then it seems like we never got taken away from Tau Ceti by Durandal after the events of Marathon 1. This seems like Durandal whisked away to find Luan once we'd beaten back the four, 
But then we, along with a bunch of other humans, were kidnapped by another four ship and put into cryotanks, and Tycho was absorbed into their computer systems at the same time. Based on that, we're seeing an alternate opening to the events of Marathon 2, except this time, it's not Durandal awakening us, it's Tycho. I'm not sure that's any better. Once we're planet side, Tycho gives us some info on where to find the captain, and we're off to the races. One thing that I do want to note here is that Infinity doesn't always do a good job of letting you know whose side you're on. There's going to be multiple times throughout the course of the campaign where allegiances will change. Sometimes we're fighting alongside the four, sometimes we're fighting alongside humans, and sometimes we'll have no allies whatsoever. In these first two levels, even though Tycho points out that the enforcers and the troopers are the ones that I need to worry about, it still didn't really click in that I had any safety around any of the aliens on screen. After all, why would I think that any of them were really on my side? I knew that they were fighting each other, but I'm a human. A rogue element. The fuck do I fit into their equations? You can see here though that I finally get a bit of a hint that I might not necessarily be on the radar of some of these enemies. This map is pretty good, reminds me a lot of most of the Marathon 2 maps where we're fighting Flicta, swimming through the water, fighting Flicta underwater. It's a decent map that doesn't really overstay its welcome, and by this point we've gotten a number of the standard weaponry, including the assault rifle. So combined with the enforcer gun and the flamethrower that's carried over from the last map, I'm feeling a lot more armed than I had at this point in Marathon 2. In fact, there's a lot more safety and security in Infinity than there was in Marathon 2. While save stations and health stations can and will be spaced out across maps, there's noticeably more of them this time around, with much more grace towards the player than last time. Tycho gives us a brief update on what's happening on the ship, noting that apparently the captain we're trying to capture has a plan in place to capture Durandal using the few remaining Sfit under four control. Control, which is, uh, by Tycho's own words, decaying. So we're trying to stop the captain from executing his plan to capture Durandal. I guess Tycho really wants to get a Durandal on his own, it seems. But as it turns out, the captain tried to beam himself off of the planet and back to the ship, but the signal was, um, redirected just outside the ship and into space, so the captain is dead and Tycho has control of the ship now. Durandal has just entered the system, with a group of humans under his direction, headed towards the ruins that we are already exploring. The plan is to let them lead us to whatever it is that Durandal is searching for, and then stop them from trying to escape in the aftermath. Durandal would be a messiah to the Sfit, but it's all a dream. There's nothing on the lawn but ghosts. <laughs> oh, buddy! Boy, is that an incorrect statement. But again, this is shit that we already know, right? So I'm playing through the game, wondering now, at this point, how much of what happened in Marathon 2 actually has ramifications here? I mean, is Toth still down here on this planet? I'm pretty sure that's the case. I mean, the terminal in Nesede Malis seems to indicate that someone, or something, very much like Toth was communicating with us. Toth's communications all came through in white colored text, just as Durandal's are in green, Tycho's in red. So if color theory still holds, then maybe Toth is out there trying to communicate with us? Maybe? And here's a brain teaser for you. Maybe activating Toth in Marathon 2 was what started up all these quantum leaps in the first place. After all, Toth is a highly advanced alien artificial intelligence which may or may not have a better grasp over quantum entanglement than Durandal does. Durandal was searching for Yaro technology, which can warp entire moons out of a solar system, so maybe Toth is powered by that same technology and can leap across timelines? Not just space? The next map has us swimming around to intercept the human cavalry, and we get a glimpse of what is obviously an AI core underwater, glowing and humming with life, but we're unable to reach it. We saw Toth's AI core in Marathon 2, and it was in a different part of the ruins, so is, is this an extension of Toth? And if it is, why is it already activated? It probably isn't Toth, because we are told by Tycho that the humans were attempting to activate an ancient Sfit AI in a flooded area of the ruins, but the humans never made it back. Tycho and Durandal are dueling in space, which has left Tycho's ship crippled. It's up to us to find a way to access this Sfit AI in order to leave nothing to chance. Ever cocky, Tycho thinks he's still got the upper hand on Durandal. This, of course, leads us to Infinity's first disturbing turn of events, which is mowing down a group of our fellow humans as a part of our pursuits. This felt 
really fucking weird. Like, we have spent two games trying to actively avoid hitting friendly targets, or to specifically pick out the simulacrums. You know, the androids that are designed to look like bobs, but they explode when they get too close to us. Fighting the bobs, actually mowing them down Doomslayer style, is a, is a really harsh reality that we have to get over quickly because this isn't the last time in the game that we're gonna have to do this. Tycho, as it turns out, wasn't as cocky as I thought he was. Despite being crippled, his ship had enough bite left in it to affect Durandal's compiler network and make his ship go offline. So, Durandal is now dealing with rampant fit. Tycho's troops have boarded Durandal's ship, and there's something else. Functioning sensors show a massive structure entering Lawan orbit. It may be some trick of Durandal's, but he won't get away. My ship carries the Trizeme. The early Nova device. <laughs> One way or another, it ends here. My troopers have boarded his ship and are fighting deck to deck. I'm sending you in to help. Last one of the core is an unarmed Bob. Whatever this massive structure is, I don't think it has anything to do with Durandal. It could potentially be the space station that was floating out in the asteroid field, just somehow moving into planetary orbit. But whatever it is, Tycho's mention of the Trizeme isn't inspiring confidence. This is the third time that weapon has been mentioned in just this game alone, and the last two times, it released that working Kackner. So I'm hoping that Tycho doesn't get trigger happy this time around. Anyways, now we need to teleport into the fray on board Durandal's ship, and maybe make it so that Tycho doesn't use the Trizeme. Yeah. So this map is called Electric Sheep 1. If you're a nerd of any caliber and you know your sci-fi history, you've already gotten the reference. And if not, that's okay. We're all here to learn. Electric Sheep is a reference to the famous Philip K. Dick novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? This novel was also famously adapted into a film, which was titled Blade Runner. Considering that we are playing as a cyborg whose true nature was hidden from them up until recently, I think it's safe to infer that whatever this map is, it's some kind of dream. Or is it? Well, we've got this terminal over here for starters. The hard path of thought. Your former self destroyed. The dreaming way is eased. Down to the crushing center. And spared the dance of forever. This appears to be from the same messenger as on Nese de Malis, with the white Toth font, so wherever here is, that voice is still clearly communicating with us, telling us that, what, we died? Your former self destroyed certainly seems to indicate that. With Tycho's mention of the Trizeme in the previous map, I'm guessing he was about to utilize that weapon to gain full victory over Durandal. So, if that's the case, then we were able to yeet out of that timeline, which then landed us, uh, here? Which is one of the many questions that Infinity doesn't outright answer. Seriously, this is a nowhere place. A dream state, if you will. Or maybe just some kind of transit station along the Quantum Leap subway line. I mean, there's literally nothing here. Nothing. A bunch of lava, a bunch of switches that don't work. One, that actually does, but that's it. There's these weird floaty winged blob things. And there's nowhere for us to go. There's a rare health pickup which tops up our health, but really the only place to go is onto this platform over here. Alright, I guess that's where we're gonna go, so... So the name of this map is Where Are Monsters in Dreams? And if Electric Sheep 1 doesn't hit you over the head that we're in some kind of dream state, then I don't know how else to explain this one. When we land in here, the first thing that hits is how dark this place is. Like, oppressively dark. I don't think we've seen any map or layout this dark since the first Marathon game. Second is the silence. Infinity's ambient effects are good, real good, and there's always some kind of something hovering around us, so to load into absolutely deafening silence is more ominous 
than the moaning and groaning of the space station in Nese de Malas. Speaking of Nese de Malas, doesn't this area that we're in kind of look like that map? A little bit? Kind of? Is it just me? Third and finally are the Ghost Svitker. Yes, that is correct. Ghosts that take the form of the Svitker, aka the mythical 11th clan of the Svit that we saw in Marathon 2. They're all invisible, the way some of the Svit compilers can cloak themselves in other areas, and they're incredibly hard to hit with your weapons, if you can even hit them at all. You can see here that I tried using pistols and assault rifle on one of them to no avail, then I bit the bullet and I tried out the flamethrower. I'm, I'm just convinced that you can't actually hit or hurt these fuckers. It makes the map incredibly stressful to run through, because the energy bolts that they fire at you hurt really, really bad, and the moment that you enter any part of this map, the ghosts will immediately start shooting at you. This is one of the few bullet hell type situations that Infinity intentionally puts you into, and I'm fine with this, because this dream state map feels intentionally stressful. Like, we've somehow been tossed out into this layer of reality against our will, and we're fighting to remove ourselves from it, all while it is fighting to stop us from getting out. Maybe this map, specifically, is a part of the work in Kackner affecting reality, warping around us, maybe even glimpsing and understanding that we, the player, are jumping from timeline to timeline, and having caught us here between jumps, it wants to prevent our escape. It certainly does feel like that. There's really only one path to take here, one lengthy, looping path that will eventually bring you back to the start. As we're running, we'll try to move across a bridge that drops to the level below as soon as we step on it. If we, below, step on the correct touch plate nearby, the bridge will rise again. Now, at the time, I didn't catch the cyclical pathfinding of the map, so even after deducing that I could extend the bridge back upwards, I didn't understand that I could potentially run around and try to cross it again. Instead, I was more focused on navigating the shadowy path ahead of me, searching for an exit of some kind, any kind. Now, you can, in fact, get the bridge back into place, circle back around and cross it, and go find a very interesting secret, but since I didn't actually do that in this playthrough, I'm not going to address it, I'm going to leave that to you kids to go investigate yourselves. Now, interestingly, there's one terminal here. One terminal that we come across twice. Now, the first time we find it, the message is this. Well, there was this knife, more aptly described as a broadsword, and I, I see, well, I was swinging down the street on my way to uh, a movie, and this guy, yeah, he, he was about six foot eight and huge. He was holding this knife, only to me, I would describe it as like a broadsword, something from the Knights of the Round. Uh, before he can even open his mouth, he collapses. Uh, meanwhile, I can barely lift a finger to put the toupee back on his glossy head because I'm shaking so much. He was vomiting, and I knew that he was alive because he kept saying something like durability between convulsions. What happened next was really bizarre. Both ends of the street flood w with black-suited men, just like in a movie. Well, these men look tough, and they look pissed off. The eyes behind their sunglasses are probably cold as my hands are getting. Uh, I feel like my heart has stopped. I'm so damn scared. As, as I start to inundate the street in black, they move with one will. So I, I figure that I'm dead anyway. So I reach down for the blade. The blade is being covered by his vomit, but the hilt is clean. I can hear the men getting excited, but I can't stop. My fingers slide around the leather hilt, which is oddly cold. <laughs> okay, so this, this is so incredibly, yeah, what, what the fuck is this? So actually, there's kind of a lot to unpack here, but unless you're familiar with mythology, you're not going to catch it at first glance. According to mythology, once upon a time, a warrior named Roland carried a sword called Durandal. You see where this is going? A knife, more aptly described as a broadsword, being carried by a six foot eight guy who collapses and keeps muttering something about durability with our narrator clearly shaken by the events and turns to note that both ends of the street have now flooded with men in black suits, and despite himself, the narrator turns to pick up the sword anyway, covered in the other man's vomit. Honestly, this is just me reaching here. I kind of feel like this is a sort of meta-narrative giving us, the player, and in a sense, the character, some insight into what is going on. Of course, at this point in the game, we're not going to understand that significance, so let's see if we can find a way out of this map first. 
As mentioned above, the map eventually loops around as we discover a path beyond the lowering bridge, a path that swoops us back to the same terminal we were just talking about a moment ago, except this time, the terminal's message has changed. 761 armless and legless corpses float inconspicuously around the inside of Hangar 96. I say that they, they are inconspicuous because it's their arms and legs which demand my attention. I did this, or I, I could have stopped it, but which is it? It doesn't matter how. I did this, I could have stopped it, but nothing in nature ever follows a Gaussian curve. Sure, sure, they'll tell, tell you that it does. does. They, they say, say that every five minutes, minutes someone dies in a car accident, but how often are there 761 armless and legless corpses in, in one hangar? Yeah, I don't have anything for this. There's a hidden detail in the green screen over here that I didn't notice on my first playthrough, not until going over my footage. Something that I'll come back to later, but I want you kids to notice this down here right now for now. Okay, so we finish reading the message, and thusly, we enter the next chapter of the game. This is a scanning buoy in a deep Luan orbit. The station is obviously not of four construction, but they are using it for a sensor relay station. You must destroy three panels at key locations around the station to cripple their warning system. You better hurry up because you will run out of oxygen if you take too long, and I am only willing to transport you two oxygen recharge containers. Otherwise, we might alert the scout ship that's been tailing us for the last several years. And if that happens, you will be spending your own time drying out in the glow of Luan's sun. When you're finished, come back here. Then we go atmosphere surfing. <sighs> Inevitably, every marathon game has at least one or two bullshit levels that confoundingly frustrate the player, all while slowly draining their oxygen. In Marathon 1, it was G4 sunbathing. In Marathon 2, it was Kill Your Television, and now, here in Infinity, it's Acme Station. So get this, right? You teleport into this map immediately after leaving Where Are Monsters in Dreams, and depending on how fucked up you got by the ghosts, you may or may not have a decent amount of health to roll forward with. Myself, I did not have that much health. I ended up going back and loading an old save to run through the map again to try and hold on to as much health as I could in order to increase my chances of survival upon entering Acme Station because, <laughs> get this, you teleport in and immediately start losing oxygen. On top of that, there are at least two drones that notice you right away, rolling towards you from opposite sides of your landing point, lobbing explosive grenades at you. On top of that, the weapons you had in the previous map are all now gone. All you have strapped to you are a pair of pistols and your fists, against multiple drones, scores of four fighters, a constant ticking clock in the form of your dwindling oxygen, and in order to find the only save station in the map, you have to action hero your way through said enemies first, and also make sure that you're even taking the right twists and turns in this maze to get here. Of course, my weapons haven't actually been taken away. In true marathon fashion, we're out in the vacuum of space, so neither the assault rifle nor the flamethrower will operate in the vacuum of space. 
I had forgotten in the moment about that little tidbit, but the manual does at least remind us of this fact in its description of the assault rifle. But getting dumped here without warning and no reminder of that tidbit made me think that I, I just didn't have a couple of my weapons anymore, especially since the next map keeps us in vacuum as well. Anyways, while Acme Station's map is an incredibly twisted maze to figure out, the map's goals are, for the most part, fairly straightforward. Find three panels using a series of teleporters, smash the panels, then get back to the start of the map so Durandal can teleport you out. I completely glossed over this bit a moment ago because I wanted to highlight the bullshit of this map, but hey look, we're back palling around with Durandal, and we're on some kind of subterfuge mission in orbit of Lawan. So, uh, what exactly are we doing here in this timeline? Are we a willing participant in Durandal's schemes and mechanisms? Are we being pushed around like we were in Marathon 2? Feels a little too early to tell, but, uh, you know, when he says, we might alert the scout ship that's been tailing us for the last several years, and notes that we're in orbit around Lawan, I'm guessing it means that Durandal himself has just arrived at the Sphid planet, and we've been activated for duty, and now we're here on Acme Station to stop the four from warning their comrades that we're trying to get to the planet's surface below. So this little set piece is taking place before what would be the opening of Marathon 2. I would also like to note that Acme Station seems to have the same technology and aesthetics as the station in Nesede Malus and Where Are Monsters in Dreams, so there seems to be a running theme here. We've never actually seen Yarrow technology, the species that granted the Sfit sentience millennia ago, so is that what this station is? And is this the same station that we were on in the prologue of Infinity, or is it something completely different? Anyways, Acme Station is the first big roadblock that players are going to encounter in this game. It isn't insurmountable, but it definitely has the odds stacked against you in a major way. Dwindling oxygen. Durandal only able to teleport in two oxygen tanks to top you up. No health stations. And hordes of enemies around every corner as you traverse the station structure. I died and reloaded multiple, multiple times just trying to get a good run through this map. However... Acme Station will yield rewards for those who are being diligent in their search for the exit. We'll find a fusion pistol close to the end if we keep hunting for ammo, although the next map after this will provide us with one right away, so missing this one isn't as big a deal as it was in Marathon 2. But the real gem of this map is going to be the single brand new weapon that Infinity offers up to us players on a delightfully golden platter. And that weapon, kids, is the Flesh It Submachine Gun. Now, as you've no doubt noticed in the highlight, the SMG runs through a clip faster than shit through a goose, and you can only carry a max of 8 magazines at a time, so relying on this weapon isn't going to be something you'll either want to do, or even be able to do from an economic perspective. But at the end of the day, the flesh it's this weapon fires will stun lock the hell out of heavier enemies, absolutely rip through lesser foes, and packs more than enough punch to justify the fast rate of fire and limited amount of ammo that you can carry. Once we found and shorted out the three panels we need in order to consider this mission a success, Durandal teleports us over to the nearby 4 Armory Station. Our mission here is to cause more subterfuge in the form of destroying a bunch of four juggernauts that are currently inactive, but are ready to deploy against us were we to land planetside. Durandal makes a small note that his ship, Boomer, has torn a hole in the side of the station, so everything here is in a vacuum, meaning we get to run around, again, with our oxygen slowly depleting. Fortunately, Double Lot must have realized that Acme Station was some old bullshit and made this a lot easier to navigate. The fusion pistol is going to be the workhorse of this mission, although having the submachine gun clears out four fighters a lot quicker if you have the ammo. And you're going to want to do that because there's no oxygen stations until you're past the halfway point of the map, meaning you need to be light on your feet, use the map to navigate, and not waste any time killing shit in front of you because you are literally going to get down to your last breath before you hit the oxygen station otherwise. If you stay nimble, you'll be fine. Midway through the mission, Durandal gives us a little update on current events. Nice light show. The human strike teams are en route to the location of a Sfit AI whose memories I want to probe. The Sfit life form is a pearl of consciousness floating in the sea of its own species. 
If any knowledge remains of the ancient times, it will be collected in the sieve of this massive network, lying dormant for all those centuries. Okay, so, uh, I guess palling around with Durandal again means we're working with the other humans again. And those humans, working for Durandal, have figured out where Toth's AI center is, and we're going in to activate it for Durandal. Similar events to the previous timeline that we were just in, except in this one, we've flipped sides and are trying to help instead of hinder. I find it really interesting that Double Ott went with this route, in that it really does show how one or two stray decisions can radically alter which side of a fight we could end up on. Just a few minutes ago, we were riding with Tycho, hell-bent on mowing down the bobs in order to capture Toth before Durandal. Now we're back on the side of the good guys. I mean, I mean, if you can call Durandal a, a good guy, I guess. Next mission is set on the remains of a water treatment plant in the armpit of Lawan, as Durandal refers to it, and... Oh, thank god, we've got the shotgun. The shotgun is so much better in Infinity than it is in Marathon 2. For one thing, it feels like ammo for it is much more plentiful, something that I think I can say across the board for all the weapons, but the shotgun especially since last time, it felt like I couldn't ever maintain enough of it. Here though, the arenas are narrow enough that I never feel like I miss that many shots. I also have plenty of ammo to bust out the shoddy in situations where I need to clear the road in front of me, and the spread even seems to have been tightened up a bit. There's a B plot in this map within the terminals we can find about a four scientist who's been attempting to requisition Sfit components to no success. So he's reversed engineered some elevator platforms into crusher rooms in order to experiment on Sfit and continue his unsanctioned research. Good to know that violating the Geneva Convention isn't just a human thing. We found some information somewhere along the way. I didn't actually see what we found or where we found it. Uh, maybe it was in the scientist terminals? But Durandal gives us a basic-ass good boy pat on the head for uploading some files that he needed, and I'm like, all right, dude, uh, whatever, I guess. I had to go back over my footage a second time and reread the opening terminal with Durandal's instructions, and I realized that when he said, find a terminal with access to the treatment plant plans, he didn't mean just read a terminal and get out of dodge, it meant that I was downloading information on how to sabotage the plant in the next map. Sometimes, and this is a gripe that I have with the Marathon series in general, sometimes these terminals are worded in such a way that they feel like they mean one thing, but actually mean something else entirely. I thought for a while that I must have been misreading the terminals as I was going through the game, but if you read them just once over, usually in a bit of a rush because the action in the game doesn't stop because you've activated one, then a lot of the more subtle intentions behind the information being delivered to the player can easily be missed. Durandal tells us that his teams have activated the Sfit AI, which we know is Toth, but I guess in this timeline, Durandal hasn't come to that conclusion yet, and he describes the AI as something mysterious and inscrutable, and that it expects something, but Durandal hasn't a clue what that thing might be. We don't get to dive deeper into that because Admiral Tafir is arriving with the Western Arm of the Four Battle Group 7, so Durandal is about to have his hands full. Yeah, remember Admiral Tafir from the prologue? Yeah, the, the guy who was doomed? The guy who keeps setting off the fucking Trizeme? So we're off to go flood the Eastern Division of the Four Ground Troops. And then, afterwards, Durandal is going to teleport us to some Sfit Ruins. The map where we flood the treatment plant is another one that I have some gripes with. There's a lot of underwater cavorting, a couple of juggernauts to take down, down, and under normal circumstances, all of this would be mostly manageable, and genuinely speaking, is a perfectly serviceable map. However, there's a flooded tower in the center of the dam that we need to swim up and into in order to activate the floodgates, but the four have rerouted access, meaning we're going to need to find some power couplings and short them out in order to fulfill Durandal's Noah fantasies. Here we've got two activation nodes that will open some doors for us in the plant, but they have a two-step process to work. The switch on the right activates something for us, but the switch on the left opens a door for us to walk through. Problem is, once we activate the left switch, there's a short timer before the door that it opened will close. The visual aid for this is this little column here that retracts and then slides back into place, letting us know the door has opened and shut. If we want to activate the door again, we need to turn the left switch off and then back on. Now, up until this point, opening doors in Marathon was as simple as either walking up to a door and pressing the use key or using a switch to activate a door somewhere in the map. But here, we have a bona fide puzzle. We have to hit the left switch to open the timed door, which is again indicated by the retracting column but in order to keep the door open, we need to hit the left switch again. 
which will keep the doors open. Something we will see as the columns no longer slide back down into place. Okay, great. That's not a terrible puzzle to get through. It's just slightly annoying since it defies door logic in the rest of the game and the series. But then we still need to track down those two power couplings to smash in order to get around the floodgate failsafes. Now, they're here. They're actually real close and on our way out of the map once we've got both heavy doors open. But there is a small problem with that. You see, over here, we've got a health recharge station just before the final terminal. And directly next to it, literally right here, next to it, in plain ass sight, is the smallest goddamn switch to lower a little panel that reveals the two power couplings. Now, there's also a juggernaut outside, which if you didn't take it down before, will be firing missiles and fireballs at you while you're trying to recharge your health. So there's a strong chance you didn't notice this tiny little switch here. If the juggernaut isn't bothering you, there's also a strong chance that you might not notice the switch because it's so fucking tiny and embedded into the wall here directly next to this giant health station, which is going to catch your attention instead. <laughs> now, if you're like me, and you kids know you are just a little bit, no one wants to be like their dads when they grow up, but we all know that we are just a little bit, then there's a real strong fucking chance that you're going to dismiss this little alcove once you've gotten your health, and you'll go running back to the rest of the level desperately trying to find these power couplings that you need to punch, and you'll spend maybe a goddamn hour of your time running, rerunning, loading, and reloading parts of the level because you're not sure where the fuck these fucking fucks are. I admit it, I broke down and I looked at a walkthrough for this map. And when the walkthrough said the panel was in the alcove with the health station, I, I scoffed at it. Couldn't be. Until I finally stopped and looked right here and I nearly threw my keyboard at my monitor. That's some fucking bullshit, double lot. Anyways, once we finally have that under our belts, we catch up with Durandal, who's in bad shape. The good news is, most of Luan Command is about under 5 meters of liquid choked with a thousand years of detritus and plant matter. The bad news is, I'm taking fire from all sides, and there's something wrong with the compilers. We're limping fast, but Fear's flagship is closing the gap. This fit AI isn't being cooperative, keeps acting confused and disoriented. Geriatric circuits. Can't use them. I need access to the foreign network, fast, and my commandos are spread thin. I'm sending you to install two uplink chips at key locations in the command complex. I'll send in a group of humans to help soften up resistance, but you will be hitting the four where their defenses are strongest. You better clear that clip. All right, so it looks like in this timeline, Toth is a no-go. It's so ancient, and maybe its systems were underwater like we saw in the previous timeline, so there's going to be no help from it at all. Meaning Toth won't be able to help us get in contact with the Svitker like at the end of Marathon 2, and basically speaking, that means we're fucking screwed. On an interesting note, Durandal says he's going to send us with a strike team of humans to install two uplink chips at key locations in the command complex, just like in the very first mission of Marathon 2. So we've come full circle now, having seen multiple possible endings of the events of Marathon 2, and now we are seeing an entirely different opening to Marathon 2. So maybe Infinity is going to have us pull like a Back to the Future Part 2 and attempt to run through that whole first mission all over again, and... Oh, oh I guess we're here again. It looks like Toph's malfunction was too much for that timeline to be salvaged, so here we are, back in the transit station to find another path to another timeline. On an interesting note, let's read the new message in the terminal over here. The way grows dim. Hungry chaos lurks behind the bright corona. Dream ahead, beyond the falling path. A billion fit lie yet unborn. Our own death foretold. Your dark mind cutting through the deeping sky. Another time. Another time. All right, this is incredibly interesting. The messenger is back, letting us know outright that the working Kackner is actively working behind the scenes with the lurking behind the bright Corona line. But the line that I want to focus on for a second here is our own death foretold. So like you would think with the mention of a billion fit yet to be born, our own death foretold is referring to that, meaning that our messenger is more than likely some kind of collective AI, perhaps the entirety of the spit compilers coming together to speak to us, accessing Yaro technology to push us through timelines in order to find a way to defeat the work in Kagner without the Trizeme going off. 
There is another answer to this particular mystery, though. One that I'm not going to reveal right here, because it's going to be so much more satisfying when we get there. I just want to point out that in reading this line, in this moment at this terminal, I was thinking that the messenger was referring specifically to the potential extinction of the Sfit. We're not going to find many answers here, however. I do my thing, I kill the Grey Sfit Enforcer over here, I activate this witch that raises the bridge for me to go across. Oddly though, this took a lot longer than it did last time. I don't know if the map is on some kind of timer or what, but the switches to activate the bridge weren't working. I thought that it was maybe because I didn't kill all the little flying mushroom duders up here, so I killed all of them. Um, and eventually, the switch lit up, and I was able to activate it. Whatever the trigger for all of this is, I, I don't know. I just know that I was standing around for what felt like a lot longer than I did the last time. Anyways, I finally get access to this platform up here. I land on it. I'm teleported back to where are monsters in dreams. Uh, I run through that again. I get the same cryptic messages about knives and Hangar 96. I go for the terminal to get out, thinking this is my way to the next timeline. And then... What the fuck? Here I am, back at Acme Station, this time with different weapons, more health, a lot less oxygen because I used up a lot of it swimming around before, so my stats and weapons are actually carrying over from mission to mission, something I wasn't sure about before, but looping all the way back to the beginning of Rage, now I get it, but, but, and this is the big question here, but why the hell am I back at the beginning of the Rage chapter? I thought, and not completely incorrectly, mind you, I thought that I had done something wrong during my progress of rage, that I had been looped back here in order to perform some kind of task that I had missed in my travels along this time stream. I distinctly remembered finding a keycard in one of the water treatment missions, but I had died shortly after finding it, and after loading back into the map, I took a very different route and I didn't pick up the keycard again. Okay, so, maybe I needed to use that keycard on something specific in that specific level in order to activate something in order to achieve the proper circumstances to get what I needed out of this timeline, question mark? So here I go, running through all the missions in Rage again, and at least this time I had a bit of an idea of what to do, so it didn't take me very long. And yes, I found that keycard, and I used it to open up a door into an alternate path through the level, but I'm gonna tell you exactly what went wrong here, kids. It's kind of neat, a little annoying, and very marathon. See, before looping back to the beginning of Chapter Rage, I wasn't on Electric Sheep 1. The map that I was on was Electric Sheep 2. Same design, very different name, very different escape route. Sure, I could take the same path back to Where Are Monsters in Dreams and that would loop me back to Rage, but that's a false idol. See, what you really want to do is get around here, past the Grey Enforcer, kill him if you like, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but you want to drop down onto this ledge here. And when you do... Our transit station mayhem is about to get really twisty, kids. Okay, so the first things first is that we teleport in. Teleport in, and if we're paying attention, we're probably not. I wasn't because I was so shocked by the transition. If we're paying attention, we can get a glimpse of the ending terminal that we're trying to reach, which is a neat little detail that I just want to point out right away. This map is called Whatever You Please, and it's hard to not see it as a continuation of Electric Sheep 2. The same aesthetics, surrounded by the same lava, surrounded by the same darkness, surrounded by the same switches we need to hit to activate the environment around us. Curiously, there's a save station pretty close in, although this is a bit of a false sense of safety considering that there are cloaked Sfit compilers floating throughout the map who will sneak up behind you and hit you with energy bolts. The first one that popped up knocked me into lava, and there's no way out of that, so here's a surprise for you. We're gonna be mostly navigating a narrow walkway and checking our flank for incoming fire as the cloaked Sfit, or maybe they're actually ghost Sfit, like the ghosts in Where Are Monsters and Dreams, continually encroach upon us, like some kind of defense mechanism attempting to stop us from making our way through the map. I just want to point out real quick that I've used the phrase transit station to describe these dreams, these in-between areas of timelines, and that metaphor is about to be put to the test with our next terminal. I should stop talking out loud. Everyone on the train is looking at me now. I, I, I must have gone farther than I wanted because everyone here is different than me. 
why should they care that I'm talking? Some of them are talking and, and about fairly irrelevant things. The ends justify the means. Where there is no justification, there is no end. There is only means. I, I thought that they were looking mean, but they were only really talking. The noise of the train crescendos as the train comes into a station. This station is lined with black-suited men, and behind them, I can see the pantomime of good and evil continue with the sanitation workers trying to mop the black suits off of the sunglassed and toupee men who are not resisting at all. Indeed, they have nothing to worry about. They could just cling to the constellations of gum. There's nothing the sanitization workers can do about that. It's all just human nature. We don't fit onto the curve either. Simply, there is no curve. Our science is approximation. Good guessing. The suits are going to get me this time, but I'm lucky. I have my keys in my pocket now, and I'm opening the other subway door. At this point, I'm convinced that these terminals, with the tale of the narrator who's found a switchblade that resembles a broadsword, is literally our character, the security officer. Mjolnir Recon number 54, attempting to rationalize and make sense of his situation through some kind of metaphor. The men in black suits are constantly chasing him, as are the ghosts of the Svit. He's riding a subway train, moving from place to place, not recognizing his surroundings because they're too different. I think this is the security officer's mind, his own thoughts, jumbled and stirred around into a narrative to help him, and us in a way, to make some kind of sense of what is happening around us. This map... Is fantastic. It feels like being in some kind of forbidden machine, constantly, frantically looking around for the guardians who are trying to end your run. The ghosts fit are damn near impossible to see even close up. Half the time you won't even know they're there until they're firing energy at you, sometimes because you mysteriously stop moving, unaware that there's an invisible being directly in front of you blocking your progress. This is absolute tension. This is paranoia. Like you could see here, right before the final terminal of the map, I'm just blasting fusion shots left and right because I know that there's a ghost fit coming. It killed me a couple times at this point already and I, I really didn't have to want to run this map again and yes it feels like I'm seeing things or hearing things but the satisfaction of seeing that static when I finally do hit it and also the understanding that there was a second one right behind it that I took out because I refused to stop firing. God the relief of making it through that one. So here's the last terminal of the level. I, I step in silently, and as is the ritual, I block the door with my bicycle, and I set the traps on the windows. Damn no way that anyone is getting in here without adequate warning. I figure that there is time now to take a good look at this knife that has caused me so much grief and to miss the movie that I was heading for but can't remember the name of. It's not unusual. Plastic about the, the, the length of my forefinger. It has two blades that opens in both directions. One is a short and the other long. The long one is pretty dull and the short one is quite sharp enough about the knife the door opens up and the bicycle falls over one of the suited guys is standing in the doorway impassive and immobile i'm not scared until i see that the hallway behind him is filled with his clones i turn over the handle of the knife and i give it a bit of a nasty grin our narrator here makes mention of the knife, the switchblade, and how it has two blades on it, one short and sharp, the other long and dull. Interesting bit of detail, as is the use of the bicycle, a mode of transport to block incoming threats. Of course, this doesn't stop the men in black from trying to get in, and our narrator now seems ready to fight. Switchblade in hand. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is really fucking important here, kids. Pieces are falling into place. Elements of story, life, however you want to name it, all here. Still cooking, but settling nearly there for our understanding. Of course, this terminal drops us into somewhere else, or I guess some when else, into a four ship with armored bobs and fusion pistols who call us a traitor's pig before shooting at us. Yep, that is the vacuum bob, a bob who's armored against the vacuum of space, ready to take us on because he looks like we've switched sides again. But something didn't sit right with me while I was playing, like the pieces didn't quite feel like they fit together correctly. At this point, I've already looped back to the beginning of Rage once, so I feel like there's paths to take here that could go one way or the other, but even though this is a new map, it doesn't feel like I took the right way to get to it. So I load my save and go back to whatever you please. I try a couple alternate routes. I try uh, scaling some platforms and I accidentally activate some gray enforcers who murk me the first time I try running through this. After some trial and error, I find a lift that I'm able to ascend up to what feels like nothing, a dead end. 
Now, by this point, I'm ready to start secret hunting. And you kids know how much I hate secret hunting. But I'm compelled by now. I'm jonesing. I want to know what the fuck is going on here. So imagine my surprise when I'm wall humping at the top of this lift and find a hidden terminal that continues the narrative of Hangar 96. I'm back in the hangar again, but now they are all screaming at me. Their arms and legs are, are no longer attracting my attention. It wouldn't be so bad if they were talking, but they aren't. They could talk too. They aren't screaming in pain, but in protest. They don't miss their arms or their legs. They all agree on one thing. They won't give me the satisfaction of hearing them talk. And I'll never forget their screaming. Pointless and wordless. Without justification. I did this and I could have stopped it. I'm trying to put pieces together with this info, but it just isn't happening. So we- Oh, oh holy fuck! Huh. All right, let's try that again here. This map is titled Carroll Street Station, and it is a rough fucking ride. We've got a bunch of hunters and a juggernaut enclosed in a tight arena that makes it difficult to get out of harm's way once you load in because you're going to drop into the center of a harsh crossfire immediately. Movement is the only way to stay alive long enough to collect your wits, and it's going to take more than one attempt. If you stick with the attempts, you're going to notice that this is the same station that we keep appearing in. The same station from Ne Sede Malis, which I think is the same station in Where Are Monsters and Dreams, which I think is the same station mentioned in the written prologue in the manual. I also am not entirely convinced that it's the same station in Acme Station, but Durandal specifically called that a buoy platform, so I'm not 100% sure. Here, we can hear that same eldritch moaning and groaning that we also heard in the prologue map, so maybe here we're finding ourselves in the presence of the Werkenkackner, the cosmic beast that seems to be at the heart of all of our woes. This fight is fucking rough, and it doesn't seem to make any sense. It's just a bunch of hunters and a juggernaut and some ominous noises. There doesn't seem to be any kind of bridge between where we were just a moment ago and where we are now. Still, I stick with it and I beat the bastards at near zero health, one HP warrior, baby. And my reward was a double health charge station that delivered two bars of health to me, in addition to a shit ton of shotgun ammo to make up for what I just expended. Here's something that'll really bake your noodle, though. This is also probably a dream. Note that the name of the map is Carol Station. Like, Lewis Carroll? Like, Alice in Wonderland? Curiouser and curiouser, kids. We get a terminal with an odd message, one that I'm... Not 100% sure who it's from. It appears to be from the messenger that's been contacting us in Electric Sheep, but what's different here is the font color. This is the same symbol and same speech pattern as other messages trying to communicate with us and push us through the timelines, but the font here is green instead of white, mentioning Fair Kalia as though there's an intimate connection to the Svit moon that housed the Svitker. Lost home anew, lost and lost. This doesn't feel like our messenger speaking directly, but relaying a message from someone else. Who that is, I, I don't know, but it certainly feels like a cry of grief. And then, at last, we're led back to this timeline. Back to fighting humans again, it seems, which is ugh, great. It means a Tycho's around here somewhere. It really can't be overstated how much damage these vacuum bobs do. Funny how when a fusion pistol is turned on us, we get a semblance of just how powerful the damn weapon really is. Although it really should be noted that categorically the fusion pistol does more damage against cybernetic beings and we are a, a cyborg so it kind of makes sense. Ah, here he is. My personal peon. Oh, oh fuck you, dude. We're here looking for Durndal's core and our mission is to head further into the ship. So that can only mean that this is the four vessel that Durndal commandeered at the end of Marathon 1 and flew out to Luan. It's actually kind of neat how all these various elements are coming together now. Bits and pieces of lore and Places that we've been that are adding up into something cohesive. Well, as cohesive as this complex, chopped-up narrative can be. In a nice little touch, we get to see that Robert Blake from Marathon 2 is here, leading the human resistance against Tycho's 4 incursion, doing their best to hold the line and keep the ship from falling into enemy hands. He notes that the Svit compilers on board are malfunctioning, attacking anyone trying to access a network. This might be Tycho's doing. He had mentioned in a different timeline that he figured out a way to negatively impact the compilers with an anti-AI attack, and then we're dropped into this mess.
So the bobs here completely ignore us, but the compilers attack us, which means that... Have we jumped timelines again? Nope. As it turns out, somewhere between the end of the last map and the loading of this map, we've just decided to turn traitor against Tycho and have rejoined our fellow humans. Tycho, predictably, doesn't take this too well. Just what do you think you're doing? Your usefulness has come to a premature end. Do you think you can defy me? Now, when I'm so close to victory, Durndal's defenses are falling all around him. Pride falls hard. The bright son of Bernard is dying. His fit are rampant, fed the chimera of their hope, a hot lead spur dripping into the gullet of his ship. Look around you. My compilers have him wriggling like a tick on a pin. And from you? Not the grateful, odd respect I so rightly deserve, is that it? Instead, base treason, mean aspect of your frightful master, turned foul. Prepare to drink vacuum, fool. Aw, you son of a bitch. Tycho teleports us out into space as our punishment for switching sides, but after a moment of panic, Durndal teleports us back inside. Thank you, old friend, or friend of a friend as the case may be. The four will have their revenge at long last, but at the price of their own humiliation. Battle Group 7 will rue the day their commanders willed their ships to Luang. I must salvage some escape for the humans fighting within my ship, but it's useless without the Sphinx. Destroy as many of the four compilers on this deck as you can. Anything to weaken their hold on my ship. I will transport in as much ammunition and weapons as I can find. The implication I got from all of this is that in this timeline, we ran the events of Marathon 1 alongside Durandal like we, the player, experienced ourselves, but we were somehow picked up from Tau City by Tycho and brought here against our will. I think. This might even be the same timeline that we were in earlier in the game. After all, uh, Tycho mentioned in that timeline that Durandal's ship was struggling, his fit were rampant, Tycho's troops had boarded the ship, and that we were being sent in to help mop up the scene. So for all intents and purposes, I don't see any reason to not think that what's happening here is a continuation of that timeline we were in earlier. In fact, I'm almost 100% convinced that it is. We need to be back here, and there's a reason for that. So we're running around the boomer, Durandal's ship, now trying to stave off Tycho's invading forces. Annoyingly, though, there's multiple terminals where we can get the Tycho message that tosses us back out into space just so Durandal can teleport us back in from space. Like... We could have only coded one of those terminals to function that way, guys. Come on. And then we get to a very strange terminal at the end of this map, which... Okay, Robert Blake gets another name drop. Great. And this terminal says that it's a message from Durandal, but the font color is in red. That's Tycho's font color. Probably a mistake, but still a strange one if you're rushing through reading this. The leader of the humans, Robert Blake, made it to the surface with all but a few hundred troops that are cut off at my core. The four are coming in strength now, with a special unit of compilers designed by Tycho for my capture and confinement. Don't let him win. So, at first, when I read, don't let him win, I assumed that meant to do whatever it took to prevent Tycho from winning the day. But, as we'll soon see, it's gonna be a similar method to something we accomplished already in Marathon 2. <sighs> The jackals are tearing at the corpse now. You're back on Durandal's pleasure barge. It's pinned in the crushing embrace of the Saphir, Admiral Saphir's own flagship, and those explosions you hear are the sounds of his elite assault troops disintegrating the human's pitiful last stand. The insects think they'll plumb Durandal's depths the way they stretched me to a hair's breadth, but I know better. If they pull his core, that pride bloated corpse will disgorge a thousand wriggling worms into the Sphinx consciousness. And I can't stomach it. My terms are the same as before. Do what I say, or drink vacuum. Destroy Durandal before the compilers finish their work, and I'll forget all your transgressions. <laughs> Great, cool, I guess we flip sides again. But maybe, and I do mean maybe, that was what Durandal was talking about in his previous message. 
The Svit compilers here are trying to get at Durandal's core, to download and contain him, and Tycho wants us to just destroy Durandal outright. As I said a moment ago, something similar to what we did in Marathon 2. Except this version of Tycho seems to understand that downloading Durandal as a method of capture and containment is simply a fool's errand. So now we get to run about the ship destroying Durandal's core again, which I did not feel good about at all. There was a genuine part of me that felt like my job was supposed to actually not destroy the core. You know what I mean? Because Tycho's four troops are hostile towards me, the human bobs don't attack me, so I'm, I'm thinking I'm still technically on Durandal's side. Tycho's offering me a way out, a way to atone for my betrayal, but while I was playing this map, I wasn't sure I wanted to take him up on it. Partially because this mission is really fucking difficult. You've got four troopers and hunters left and right, raining down explosions and hit scan ballistics at you as you slowly navigate your way around, exposing every part of Durandal's core. This being such a frustrating, elongated mission did not help. I do like the map design here, though. It's fairly open-ended, allowing you to take multiple paths through the ship to reach each trigger to expose another part of Durandal's core, but this can also get a little confusing because some of the pathways overlap each other, so you can't just rely on the auto-map to know exactly where you are. Too many paths cross over too many paths, so it can be really difficult to discern which hallway you're in so that you can navigate using this visual. Eventually, after exposing each of the cores, we make our way down a junction to the last exposed circuits, and as I landed at the bottom, I picked up a circuit chip. Now, I didn't understand that I picked it up in the moment. I got the screen flash and sound effect indicating that I had uh, picked up something, and if you look down here in the corner, there's clearly a little marker showing that I have, in fact, picked up said chip. But up until this point, there hasn't really been anything for me to pick up and use outside of the key card way back earlier in the Rage chapter, and I didn't really remember seeing that little icon in the corner of my HUD then either. So, to make a long story short, I was really confused by this instance, and I genuinely wasn't aware that I had picked up this circuit board. This message from Durandal didn't exactly help me out. What to save and throw away. The last hour is on us both, mister. Stuck this little kitty into the impenetrable brain pan. Contents under pressure. Do not expose to excessive heat. Vacuum. Blood trauma. Immersion in liquids. Disintegration. Reintegration. Hypersleep. Humiliation. Sorrow or harsh language. When the tide comes, whose life will flash before yours? A billion paths are here inside me. Yes, yes, yes. Bernard, 110. Potential. Jewels. Jewels. Yes, jewels. In case you kids didn't understand that, and I certainly didn't in that moment, the circuit board we just picked up contained Durandal's AI. And we've just basically inserted that chip into our own consciousness. We are a cyborg, after all. Durandal's Hail Mary was for us to destroy his core, but to download him into our own mind before doing so. Yeah, no, I didn't pick up on that at all either when I played this through the first time. Which is a goddamn shame, because that is really necessary to understanding events past this point. I do love the little line about a billion paths in front of me, though. Anyways, so collecting the chip and reading that message before we destroy the last core teleports us back out into the ship. We have to return to that junction to destroy that last core. I decided to just load my save and return. So, now, destroying the core and then reading that terminal gives us this message. The burning air. A cold star looked down on his creations and willed that they should kill their sons. The hardest lesson ever taught to a father, to a son. A moment in time, destroying its father. Destroyed by itself after. Dream the dream beyond life and self. Find the new way. The messenger has returned, but we're not out of the woods yet, kids. Now we're in Electric Sheep 3, and there is an entirely different way to go right off the bat. No fucking around here. So, okay, let's follow this to the end, and...
Oh, God damn it. It wouldn't be a marathon game without us getting teleported into lava, would it? At least there's a health pickup right here right away if we need it. Anyways, there's a terminal nearby once we're out of danger that is super cryptic. It's in the same white font as the mysterious messenger, but the logo that opens up isn't the same as the messenger's previous intro logos. This seems like it's coming from Toth, the Sfit AI. Find the right way down through the maze to the food, then find the exit. Push the exit button. If the food tastes awful, don't eat it. Go back and try another way. They want the same thing that you do, really. They want a path, just like you. You are in a maze in a maze, but which one counts? Your maze, their maze, my maze? Or are all mazes the same, defined by the limits of their paths? Existence is simple. Find the food, push the button, hit the treadmill. But sometimes it gets much harder. Sometimes the food makes you sick, or you can hear nearby feet racing you, urging you on. Sometimes the button only gets you landed right back in the beginning of the maze again, and the food won't satisfy. There is only one path, and that is the path that you take. But you can take more than one path. Cross over the cell bars. Find a new maze. Make the maze from its path. Find the cell bars. Cross over the bars. Find a maze. Make the maze from its path. Eat the food. Eat the path. Okay. This might be the most clear set of instructions we've gotten so far in this entire game. It's all metaphor, yes, but we're running our way through multiple mazes, hopping from one timeline to the next, trying to find our way through this experience to a singular ending that will be the best possible way out. This map, called Eat the Path, is us doing exactly that. It's more of the same, lava-filled environments, ghosts fit following us around, until we get here, a window to the outside world. Gray fit compilers, just like the gray 4 enforcer in Electric Sheep. This is new, different. I'm not sure what the gray color is supposed to signify with these enemies. Maybe they're like the white blood cells of the time stream. Maybe they're able to sense our manipulation of events, crossing from one path to another, defying the laws of physics, nature, hell, the laws of existence. And they're trying to put themselves in our path to stop us. This map is pretty straightforward. We fight our way to a series of switches that raise narrow walkways for us to cross over the lava until we reach the final terminal here. And once again, it's a message that seems to be from Toth, or from our own mind. Wait, are we even actually here? I'm getting nervous because her voice is carrying some emotional baggage with it now. Ever since you brought me that chewing gum on the lark, I've been in love with you. Sure, my response might have seemed a little cryptic. If there is no justice, then how can the ends justify the means? Take that wax, for example. I've started to ramble on now, just like on the subway, and she is looking at me with that same look of hostility, bordering on the old, familiar, meaningless, uncommunicative scream. When the candle was lit, did it, did it know that in the end that it was going to burn down to nothing and disappear into the air? You lit the candle to get the light from it. Your end was to have my asparagus and carrot cabin lit by this light. You used the candle as a means to obtain this. Does the light justify the destruction of the candle? What is justification to a piece of wax? It's the same as the justification that you've given me about this durability and our relationship. Okay, so I've clearly missed something in between events. Our narrator here, the same one from the subway who picked up the switchblade that is like a broadsword, is talking to a woman. And I find the idea of a candle being burned, creating light, but the wax being destroyed, very interesting. Creation is an act of destruction after all. There isn't a lot of time to ruminate on this notion, because now we're on to the final chapter of the game. Ah, uh, yes! The first map of the final chapter is titled, By Committee. And boy, oh boy, do I fucking hate this map. To start with, we've been stripped of all of our weapons. We are fist-starting this one, kids. <laughs> oh, I probably shouldn't put it that way. And we've got a lot of four that we need to figure out a way around. There's at least a pistol to pick up nearby, but not a lot of ammo. And then we get to chat with Tycho. To make a long story short, we're back in the timeline where we destroyed Durndal's core, but installed his circuit board into our own brain pan to save him. Curiously, I noticed that we don't have the circuit icon in our HUD anymore. 
strange. But the, the four are fed up with Tycho. They've imprisoned him in a containment drive, and the Sfit are torturing any human survivors that they have in their garrison. On top of that, Tycho knows we've got Durandal inside of us, but he's willing to cut a deal to save both our asses as long as we get him out of his digital prison. We just have to cut power to the complex here so Tycho can get out and remote pilot a ship. What follows is... Ooh, probably my least favorite map in the game, even more than Acme Station. This is a long, meandering, winding map that has us up against dozens of four, tens of cyborg drones and their explosive weapons, and us with pretty much only pistols for most of the map. I managed to find the power circuits that Tycho wanted me to cut off fairly early on, but there was this whole prison maze that I felt compelled to search through in order to see what else I needed to find. The downside to all of this is that the prison is underneath the rest of the map, so trying to read the in-game auto map to figure out where I was during all of this felt like reading blueprints if you don't know how to read blueprints. Oh, and some of the cell doors are booby traps, so if you cross over them, they attempt to crush you. Oh, and some of the bobs down in the prisons are actually simulacrums, so just... <laughs> There's a lot of things exploding in this map, most of them exploding near you, and that's just not good for staying alive. Anyways, I got lost for a good long time before I finally made my way back to the opening area and the terminal that Tycho and I had been communicating through initially, which secured my victory and our way forward. Tycho lets us know that we were being interrogated by the four for two weeks without cracking, and while he's impressed with us, he's still pissed about the betrayal. So we get one last shot at proving we're worth keeping alive assaulting the base of the remaining humans on Lawan. This next map, 1,000 thousand slimy things, is a bit of a mess. I can definitely chalk up part of it to skill issue in the beginning, but there's a lot going on here that doesn't live up to the tightly detailed maps that we've been blessed with up until this point. First off, if you want something more potent than pistols, you're gonna have to dive into the water and retrieve an assault rifle. Now, I thought the water was too low for me to get out just by swimming upwards, and that I needed to grenade hop my way up and out. I died a bunch of times attempting to do so, but it just turns out that the water is constantly rising and falling, so you need to time your swim upwards so that the water is at its highest peak when you try to get out, and you'll actually free willy your way up and onto dry land. It's frustrating, but eventually doable. The rest of the mission, though, is kind of a fuck. We've got a lot of strangely uneven terrain we need to cross over, meaning a lot of floaty gap hopping to find our way through. Most of the terminals here are messages from Robert Blake warning everyone of the assault and giving orders to his men on how to defend themselves. Now, part of the problem here is twofold. One, since we're engaging the humans in combat, there's a lot of hit-scan enemies who will open fire on us the moment they see us, even if we don't see them. You can take a lot of fucking damage without warning if you're not paying attention. Number two, all this gap hopping means that if you fuck up a gap hop in the wrong spot, you'll have to swim through a good portion of the map to backtrack to a spot that will let you climb back up, and then you'll have to cross all that dry land you've already crossed just to return to the gap you failed to cross and try again. Some of these gap hops are real persnickety and require absolute precision perfection to get across. It, it's definitely doable, it's just, I don't know, this map just feels a little overcomplicated to me. It ought to be an intense assault on the bomb base, you should really feel tense and maybe racked with a little guilt over shooting up more humans, but instead it devolves into a frustrating slog in places with the finicky floaty physics. And man, I was honestly a little too happy to gun down the bobs here. Seriously, they're so frustrating to fight that where I should have felt some shame in this, I was mostly relieved when I took one out before they got me. So then we get another message from the final terminal in the mission and, oh wait, look up here. This message isn't from Tycho, it's from Admiral to Fear. <laughs> Guess what, kids? You remember that last message that I was telling you about that told us that we were going on an assault? That was from Admiral to Fear also! If you don't look up here and read this info, if you're just reading the body of the message and assuming that the red font means that Tycho is talking to you, you'll probably miss this very important information that Admiral to Fear of the Four is now in communication with us and calling the shots. You know what's even worse is that we get the Tycho logo at the opening of these messages. It, it makes it even more confusing. This incredibly subtle shift of who is sending the message without overtly informing the player that it is someone other than who we're assuming is communicating can lead to massive confusion. It did for me. I didn't understand why Tycho would be talking about the hindmost crash or serving the four. It was a very weird shift and I was so thrown by it, but I figured that I just had to serve some kind of purpose for Tycho's arc, question mark, maybe. 
No, it was just Admiral Tafir taking over communication to talk to us now. And again, this is such a subtle conveyance of information as to who is speaking to us that I even glossed over it again while going over the footage to write this script. That's why a moment ago, I referred to the speaker as Tycho. I didn't write that in the script intentionally to prove a point. I wrote it in because I once again missed the fact that it was Tafir's communication. Although I did leave it in the script to be able to circle back and prove a point. At least when Robert Blake is sending messages, the terminals are set up in such a way that we can't help but know that it's Blake communicating, and not Durandal. I don't think that it's too much to ask that Tycho's comms and Tafir's comms could have been a little bit more visually distinguishable at first glance. Anyways. Alright, so the humans are using a volcano as a defensive position, and Tafir sending us in to deactivate all of the redundancies that are keeping the lava shields active. Deactivate all of them, and we'll be able to descend into the magma tunnels to flush out the bobs, and maybe Admiral Tafir will show us some mercy. This map, a converted cathedral in Venice, Italy, is another controversial marathon map from the brief investigation I did on it. There are a bunch of switches around the map that we have to activate, and if we were paying attention to Tafir's previous message, we need to make sure that we activate them all. The frustrating part of this is that these switches will light up when we've used them, but then return to a non-illuminated state a moment later. So, if we're casually running around and can't remember which switches have been switched, a brief glance won't inform us of this. We'd have to either run up and try to switch it again, or launch another precious grenade if it's out of reach. Only by noting that the switch refuses to light up again will we know if we've already hit that one. There's also a couple sections where we are forced to swim in the lava pools to access certain sections of the map, but Double Ott has learned from Bungie's prior sins and have left plenty of health stations close to these areas so that we can top ourselves up on health right away. This kind of mindful design makes swimming through lava much more tolerable, because even though we're forced to take damage, we can at least have the ability to restore ourselves pretty much right away in order to continue onward with a little bit less stress. Only a little bit less stress. However, because this map is literally swarming with bobs and vacuum bobs, meaning we will be under near constant fire from all angles as we make our way through the map, this is the human's last stand, and we're, unfortunately, their executor. So, okay, you might be thinking to yourself, what's the big deal here? A bunch of switches to activate, and they're not always telegraphed. Uh, lava to swim through. Pretty straightforward marathon bullshit, if not a little tedious to deal with, right? And you would be right. A converted church in Venice, Italy is a fairly straightforward experience. There isn't much in the way of story for us to engage with in the few terminals that are here, as most of them are just messages from Robert Blake Rally the troops. However, not hitting all the switches can and will result in one of the sloggiest backtracking escapades of the entire series. Not quite as frustrating as Colony Ship for Sales Cheap, but as you can see here, this pathway at the end that leads us back across the map and to the next section we need to go through is blocked off if we missed any of the switches. In fact, there are specific ones along this path that cut us off, and a brief glance at the map can tell us which. Alright, so, once we've made it through the switch swatching portion of the map, we find a health station, save station, and a terminal where Admiral Tafir lets us know that we have to flood the caverns below with lava and then make our way out. If we survive, Tafir will transport us out. Making our way down into the caverns is a beautifully fraught exercise in suspense and tensions, as we're making our way through the darkened caverns slowly, checking corners for bobs, as they could be anywhere down here, and they're usually directly in front of us, completely hidden in shadow. One wrong move or step and they'll see us before we see them, and we'll be taking more damage than we can handle, especially if we're about to flood the caverns with lava and attempt to escape. But here's the rub. At first, it's going to feel like you need to conserve as much health as possible as you go through the caverns. Take anything more than two hits of damage from the bobs, and you won't have enough health afterwards to survive the chamber flooded with lava. So, it's super tense. It is absolutely sweaty. Until you realize that after clearing the cavern of the bobs, you can just backtrack all the way up the stairs, and then come back down and flood the chamber and swim upwards. If you have anything less than a full yellow bar of health, which is a double layer of health for those keeping track, then you're not going to survive to swim upwards. Making things even more angsty is that there's a whole squad of bobs waiting for you at the top of the exit shaft, so you're progressing from weapon damage to lava damage to weapon damage in a heartbeat. Now, fortunately, if you're sneaky enough, and after about a half dozen tries I figured out how to be sneaky enough, there's a purple health station right over here that you can access before you engage the squad to give yourself a leg up. Now, I like this map. I really do, because it genuinely asks you 
to stop and think about how you're going to proceed with everything. 30 odd switches that you have to activate, a bunch of humans you have to survive and plow through, a lava flow you have to swim through to survive, and still have enough health left over at the top to take out another dozen combatants? Is it a chore? Yes. Is it frustrating and a bit of a slog? Definitely yes. But when you stop and consider your tools instead of just plunging forward into combat, is it a rewarding experience? Honestly, yeah, it is. This is what I like about the marathon games. When the design is presented thoughtfully, precisely, it genuinely asks you to stop firing at literally everything for half a second and then consider what you are doing. The game might be a little misguided in how it communicates that to the player sometimes, but when it's being as smart as it actually can be, it's a wondrous experience. However, when it submerges you in lava or surrounds you with enemies, the stress can come fast and fearsome, transforming a game dripping with atmosphere into something more twitchy. And twitchiness isn't really what Marathon's design is good at doing. Admiral Tafir lets us know that our actions have caused the remaining human soldiers to surrender, so we should be proud of ourselves for saving as many of our fellow people as we have. Like, that's gonna make me feel any better about this, but fine. Our reward is that we're going to teleport out to a place of confinement before we get put into cryosleep and undergo, uh... <laughs> conditioning. You kids do remember that the four are a group of slavers, right? Well, we teleport out, but we don't get teleported into confinement. Oh no, no, we're out here being a rogue element in the four's plans, and we're back to sticking it to the man, baby. Based on the terminals that we find in this map called Son of Grendel, we've landed in the four garrison out here on Lawan, and there are a lot of terminals here, let me tell you. This is essentially another puzzle map where almost every terminal teleports us to a new spot in the map, and we need to zip zop away around in order to piece together the correct combination of switches and terminals to clear out our way to an unearthed alien artifact, which the four have decided to bury and seal off. The remaining units here in the garrison have been instructed to look out for the uh, rogue conditioned unit, aka us, and exterminate with extreme prejudice. Not gonna lie, this map feels like it meanders a little bit. I got the sensation that Double Ott wasn't 100% sure where they were going with this one. Like, they knew the ultimate outcome and ultimate goal of the endgame, which is basically where we are headed with this, but this map just feels a little... I don't know, a little too big, a little too directionless, a little too open, which as a result ends up costing the game a bit of momentum in that it can be far too easy to get lost and turned around and wonder exactly where we need to go next. This map reminded me a lot of the design aesthetics from Marathon 2, and not in a good way. I spent a good long time, maybe half an hour or so, just exploring, trying to figure out where the hell this supposed artifact was, and then finally came across a terminal with a message from Toth. Threads pull taught the way, like as like our hidden one. Quick venge the hot spur here, dying in the course. And then underwater, another Toth message. Come below, the long sleep ends, bound to aught, ever doubled as one. There's at least an image for us to follow with this message, which required a lot more running around to find my way back to a point on the map that I had already passed over once before. And then at last, I finally figured out that I needed to stand still on this teleport pad. Something which I had almost done earlier, but I moved off of the point I needed to stand on before I came to a complete stop so it didn't teleport me. <laughs> Voila! Uh, where are we? This map, titled Strange Eons, is the home of the unearthed alien artifact that the four were talking about in the previous terminals. This isn't Toth's data core. We've seen that. No, this is something else. Now, since we've been trying to keep track of the more overt sci-fi reference that Infinity makes, the fact that this map is titled Strange Eons is very interesting indeed. The phrase comes from a quote by H.P. Lovecraft, That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons, even death may die. Now, I'm gonna take a big leap here, but I think this reference is specifically aimed at Durandal, Toth, and our mysterious messenger. Maybe even at the security officer himself, but let's put a pin in that for now. We find a message from Toth. Strange and cryptic though, but the repeated use of the word foresight implies something here. Toth, as an AI, utilizes Yarrow technology. It might be spit by design, but I believe that Toth actually is built on Yarrow tech. It would explain a lot about how Toth operates, and how our journey has led us to this specific point in this specific timeline. 
Regardless, there's four rooms here in the map, four data cores that we need to bring online, the fourth of which has a series of rising and falling platforms that allow us to cross the room and into a separate area where we can find an interface that's missing a circuit board. Okay, but here's the problem. Where's the circuit board? At first, I was stridently lost. I searched up and down all over, looking for some kind of switch to activate. I couldn't find anything, until out of desperation, I dove into each of the four shallow pools in the center of the map, and I found the circuit I needed to put into place. Now, here is where everything that we've done comes to a head. This whole game has been about an elongated series of cat and mouse hunting, not just for weapons or resources, but for understanding. Understanding of everything that is actually happening to the universe around us. We install the circuit board, and the final data core lights up. We go back to the terminal in the central hub, and... The graven image stirs. We are whole again. And even more, our voice, our horn, approaches. The ancient one returns. The watery cheek, sullen star, Kalia and the wrathful sun, Sabuth. Guess what? The font color might be a little off, but at last, we've met the messenger. Not too long ago, we picked up a similar circuit board, one that we used to install Durandal directly into our consciousness for safekeeping. This time, we used a circuit board to transfer Durandal into this alien data core, and voila! We've just combined two AIs into one singular being. Durandal and Toth have now joined as one. This screen, this symbol, this method of talking, the Durandal Toth hybrid is the messenger that has been pulling us through the timelines and the electric sheep dreams and the way stations this entire time. We'll stop to reflect on that in a minute here, but for now, I just want to point out something very specific. This name. You see this name? This name isn't mentioned anywhere in Infinity up until this point, and yet it's a major name in Marathon Mythos. So don't worry, we'll get there, kids. I just needed to make a point real quick. Teleporting back to the four garrison, we get to witness, for the second time in Marathon's story, the arrival of the Svitker to Lawan, here to reclaim their home and rejoin their brethren. You see, what the messenger was telling us a moment ago, specifically about Kalia and Sabuth, was that they had made contact with the Svitker, and the 11th clan was coming back to kick some serious ass. Tycho, meanwhile, isn't thrilled with our actions. Yes, it is definitely him this time yelling at us. I'm fine, tipped hat at askance. I've... So far held you back from my rantings, but you know what you did was bad, don't you? You've been fighting doubt itself, elusive as I am. You should have doubts about what you're doing, about what you've done. Except that you can't remember exactly. Is that it? I should spend some time enlightening you. Massacres occur at your beck and call. Worlds destroyed, reborn, alight with the screams of the dying. Perhaps Sabuth will tell you what I cannot accept as truth, but perhaps he will just be lying, overcome by power and deceit. My domain. Enough rambling for now. Soon you will be destroyed by doubt. This reborn Durandal Svit entity will not escape. Neither will I. Neither will you. Do you know what kind of hat I'm wearing? A party hat. You don't get one. An honor will this party be, a party in your honor, for your honor. Some of Fear's personal guards are going to be there. You'll be introduced shortly. Prepare to die. Number one, Tycho seems to understand what we've been doing, hopping across time streams, gathering information and data, and bouncing from place to place with this intel in order to alter the course of the timeline we're currently on. But secondly, Tycho is absolutely done with our shit. <laughs> If I'm reading this right and interpreting it right, then he's the one who's about to pull the trigger on the Trizeem. So we get teleported into a big arena fight with multiple stages to get us out of Tycho's way. This fight is fucking dope. This is exactly the kind of gratuitous finale I would have hoped for in a marathon game. Remember those gray enforcers and gray fit from the Eat the Path map? Now we get to fight waves of new gray colored four. Fighters, troopers, hunters, and a bronze colored juggernaut. All of them have something like twice the normal amount of health points that their standard counterparts have, so this fight is nasty. Hope Ranger don't say balls nasty. Balls nasty. Shh. What a fight. There's a save station and health recharge station that we can take advantage of in between waves, and there's plenty of ammo, but that doesn't mean this is a walk in the park at all. Uh-uh, kids. This arena battle is super sweaty, all the way up until that juggernaut falls. Now, there is a bit of a trick to the goings-on that isn't communicated very well. 
Something that I didn't notice until reviewing this footage is that some of the soldiers will drop a circuit board for us to collect and place into specific slots around the arena. I didn't even realize I was picking them up, as, again, the little icon down here is super subtle. Maybe it's just me not really paying attention, but another factor is, again, the marathon games don't require the player to pick up keys, or in this case circuit boards, very often. In fact, the only time the game ever required it was all the way back in the first map of Marathon 2 if I'm remembering off the top of my head correctly. And if I'm not remembering that right, that just goes to show how often it happens. However, that being said, using all the boards gives us access to a lift that takes us to the upper areas of the Colosseum, where we'll find a message from the messenger. Well, I mean, I guess you can use the boards to access the upper areas. I, I was super confused, so I decided to rocket jump up there. I had a whole full purple bar of health. I was fine. I do appreciate how it demonstrates how the messenger is overriding the floor transmission with the font color swap. See, this game can communicate ideas clearly when it wants to. Also, Sabooth and Saboth are the same person, just different spellings. The game does that sometimes. It's some... Don't... I... I don't care. Anyways, we finally get some insight on what the fuck the Work and Kagner actually are. The four have discovered our rebirth. We've contacted Saboth. The Spitker will arrive momentarily with all of their vengeance, and the four will soon be pressed to use the Trizine. Saboth knows only legends about the Work and Kagner, imprisoned in Lawan's son. If the four are allowed to use the Trizine, the Work and Kagner will escape from its gravity prison. According to the legends of a thousand worlds, only a few of which are still habitable, the Work and Kagner are those things that live in chaos, creating it around them. At the beginning of their universe, they were unmistakable in their entities, but as time has gone by, their existence has become difficult to detect among the chaotic elements of the universe, hidden in stars, trapped in storms, forever looking along the event horizons of black holes. Setting one free in ordered space is difficult and insane. Of course, the four are oblivious to what they're about to do. Even to fear would be loath to release something so destructive that its mythos has survived throughout the galaxy for over 60 million years. To stop the four from their folly and our demise, you must activate the ancient station that Euro used eons ago to trap the work in Kackner. If we can activate it in time, it will crush the four fleet before we're all destroyed. Uh, okay. Sick. We have a clear-cut definition of what the work in Kagner is. We have clear instructions on what we need to do in order to win the day. We're referencing the space station hovering in Lawan orbit that's been part of this story since the very first map. You know what, kids? I think that for the first time in this entire game, we know exactly what is going on, and we know exactly what we need to do. One last interaction with the messenger informs us that Kalia has entered planetary orbit. Can you, can, you, can you imagine that? Just an entire fucking moon just warping it out of nowhere like, holy fuck! Tafir has ordered that the Trizeme be deployed, so we're off to the cinematic finale of this entire escapade. And... Uh... Oh, oh shit. This is the station from the prologue. Acme Station, Carroll Street Station. We've been here multiple times, but were we here in dreams or were we here in different timelines? Before we get much deeper story-wise, I want to talk about this map. I Max Zucker is the name of it, and it is a massive beast. A huge achievement for any game in 1996, let alone one on a Mac. Upper and lower floors, Rooms over rooms, pathways that double back over themselves, elevators and platforms and hidden passageways. I genuinely couldn't believe how massive and how intricate this map is. It's a genuine testament to how talented the devs at Double Ott were, and as far as final maps in any boomer shooter, holy shit, this is epic. We're going to be running around a lot, fighting only hunters and a couple juggernauts on this station, which, just to confirm again, is absolutely 100% the exact same station that we have seen in multiple stages along the way. We've also got Svitker here on the station who are lending us a hand. Do yourself a favor, try not to hit the Svitker in any kind of crossfire. You don't want to piss them off on top of dodging incoming fire from hunters, of which there are literally dozens around every single corner you can imagine, so... There's a lot going on here. Safe stations are going to be few and far between. Health stations as well. Double Ott really didn't make this one a walk in the park. No. 
We have to earn our way to a happy ending here, kids. Long story short, we need to find two circuit boards that we then have to install into two specific slots, which is all well and good, but this is also a tremendously large map, which means a lot of searching, a lot of running around, kind of blind, and considering that the very first terminal on the map is the one that tells us where to put these, makes it a little too easy to feel incredibly lost at times. And yet, the map is fully loaded with awesome secrets and cinematic moments around every corner. Like here where the Svitker are attacking a juggernaut and actually take the damn thing down. And this moment, holy fucking shit. I took a freight elevator to the upper level of the station and walked out into the same arena where I had fought the four on the Carroll Street Station map. When this happened, I literally gasped out loud. A genuine holy shit moment. A stunning moment of surrealism in which I couldn't tell if I was in the dream or if I was in the reality of the game. Simply because I had done this fight before, in this arena before, in a different part of the game that was heavily implied to be a dream, or maybe a peek into a different timeline. You know that feeling of deja vu, but when that feeling is accompanied by a feeling like you've experienced something before, not in real life, but in a dream? That was the sensation I had when I exited this elevator and entered this arena. I have never experienced that in a first-person shooter, and very rarely ever experienced that in any kind of video game ever. I, Max Sicker, is a massive, overwhelming map that took me maybe around half an hour to fully explore and figure out its secrets. But at the end of the day, I found the two circuit boards I needed to bring the station back online, and I found the last terminal of the game. You've done it. The Yarrow Station is online, and we're wrapping the Nova in its containment fields. The creature, or creatures, Sabuth fears, are either dormant or a myth. We've done nothing to account for his terror. The Svitker have routed the four, capturing their flagship and forcing their High Admiral to flee the system, what little there is left of it. The Svit are preparing to bid farewell to their beloved home forever as the sun collapses in on itself and the lonely marshes fade into a deepening twilight. The newly chosen olders of the remaining Svit are capturing as many of the afflicted creatures and other native life as is feasible before they must leave with Kalia. They are hopeful, though, and with our help will carve another paradise out of the void. To you, we are deeply grateful, and release what little hold we might, as Durandal, have had on your soul. Go. And with that, we've finished Marathon Infinity. But there's always one last screen to engage with. Here we see Durandal, or the messenger really, but at this point I'm just going to refer to him as Durandal. At the heat death of the universe, the end of all things, choosing to not escape the path of destruction, but instead ruminates in a quantum moment between moments. Durandal ponders over a strange hybrid, an enigma. Not Sabuth, who who I still don't understand his importance, but we'll get to him soon. No, Durandal is thinking about us. But you were dead a thousand times. Hopeless encounters successfully won. A man long dead, grafted to machines your builders did not understand. You follow the path, fitting into an infinite pattern. Yours to manipulate, to destroy and rebuild. Now... In the quantum moment before the closure, when all become one, one moment left, one point of space and time, I know who you are. You are destiny. Excuse me, what? What? Okay, so there's a lot to take in here, and no... Bungie slash Double Odd did not have some grand master story plan involving Halo or Destiny all the way back here with the ending of Infinity. But essentially, this is what I got from out of this. Security Officer Mjolnir Recon number 54 has somehow ascended beyond the confinements of time, or maybe slipped between the confinements of time. I'm not 100% sure, but if we look at Infinity's story objectively, here's what we get. Through some unknown means, the security officer finds himself glitching between multiple fragmented timelines, pulled through all of these by an anchor, a through line, possibly under the influence of the messenger, who is the hybrid consciousness of Durandal 
and Toth. The security officer's purpose throughout these fragmented timelines isn't to find a way to save any of them, but to gather information on what will happen if he should fail the primary timeline he will be returning to. Because, you see, there is a primary timeline to return to, one in which there is still time to route the oncoming threat of the Warkenkagner. Marathon 2's events do not take place in that primary timeline. They are the events of a possible timeline, but not the one that we are aiming to rectify. Did we come from that timeline? Yes, because that's how we're able to remember the events of the previous games. Marathon 1 and 2 lead into each other, but Marathon 2 is a failed timeline, which we know because the Trizeme is used and Durandal escapes without rectifying the release of the Warkenkagner. I do believe that Marathon 2's final screen is, in fact, an event that does take place, but it only takes place in this new, resolved timeline that we have traveled so far to see to safety. Along the way, the security officer becomes aware of his surroundings, of his place in the grander scheme of things, how small he is, and yet how much he can influence everything around him. Just as the AIs of the Marathon universe have three stages of rampancy, aka becoming self-aware, which are melancholia, anger, and jealousy, so too does the security officer engage in three stages of his own rampancy, his own self-awareness, despair, rage, and envy. He has become aware of how time is not linear, how it can be manipulated, folded to the benefit of those who understand how to do so. The terminals we find telling us the story of the guy finding the switchblade? That's the security officer sending himself messages back in time to help him understand what is going on. The switchblade has two knives on it, one long and dull, the other short and sharp. Durandal would no doubt refer to himself as the sharper blade, because of course he would, but even if that wasn't ego at work, the longer blade being dulled can be a metaphor for Toth having existed for longer, being more worn and used, but also tempered, while Durandal having existed for a shorter length of time is sharper and quick to cut at those he needs to cut. But when the man finds the switchblade, he takes it from someone else, someone dying, someone whose head is not well. When our narrator picks up the switchblade, it's covered in the other man's vomit, a release of something from inside his own body. The image of the toupee falling off, that could be a representation of a different security officer, one who has lost his faculties, but has put together the hybrid Durandal-Toth AI, the messenger, an act which would have required Durandal to have been stored in the security officer's body and then removed, not unlike a hidden switchblade vomited up. And when the narrator of this story finds a switchblade, he turns to use it on the men in black, which are not unlike the enforcers and Sfit in gray. Metaphors for antibodies trying to prevent outside influence on the time stream. There's also the imagery of the subway station, of trying to find the right exit, of recognizing he took the wrong exit because everyone around him looks correct but also wrong. These are metaphors for the journey he's taking across the timelines in a desperate attempt to find one outcome where the four do not accidentally unleash the working Kagner with the Trizeme. Because the one constant throughout each timeline is that the four use the Trizeme. Every single time, in every outcome, no matter how we look at it, that is going to happen. Now, what's interesting is that the space station with the Yarrow technology that can contain the supernova and the working Kagner, that seems to be slowly getting closer to the planet of Luan across timelines. In the written prologue, Admiral Tafir notes that the station is out in a remote asteroid field on the fringes of the Luan system. Later on, we end up in Acme Station, still outside of Luan orbit, and yet, still, later on, Durandal notes that the station is entering Luan's orbit. So, somehow, this space station has moved itself into position across timelines without influence. It has put itself into the position it needs to be in in order to fulfill the security officer's quest. But I don't believe that it is necessarily without influence. We've been on the station multiple times over the course of the events of the game. Snippets of information, snapshots of images. In a sense, we've been manipulating the course of the station ourselves. How? <laughs> Fuck if I know. Yarrow Tech seems to have the ability to exist beyond the scope of linear comprehension. That's how the Messenger, a fusion of human tech and Yarrow Tech, is able to broadcast backwards in time to the security officer. The Messenger knew it needed to be created, and that the security officer was the only one with the ability to cross the streams and do so. Alright, so how did the security officer have the ability to do this? At the end of the game, Durandal makes mention that the officer was created with technology that his human creators did not understand. Well, and this is a bit of a stretch, I admit, and one that I'm not making on my own. This is a theory that other players have, and I would not have reached of my own accord. But what if the technology used to create the battle roids 
is actually Yarrow technology. I don't know how the Earth scientists would have gotten their hands on it, but hey, it answers multiple questions, and it explains how the security officer could go through the stages of rampancy on his own, breaching the gaps between timelines, seeing outside of himself, becoming a force of reckoning, a force of destiny. And like, I could dive a little deeper, but look... <laughs> I am literally on page 76 of a script that I really did not intend to last longer than, I don't know, 30 pages. This is probably going to be a video close to two hours in length, if not longer, covering a game that I initially did not want to play, but have instead found myself in awe of. Marathon Infinity is a monument. No, no. More than that, Marathon Infinity is a house of leaves. A winding, living, breathing thing that is bigger on the inside in a way that feels impossible. And yet you cannot ignore just how much more there is to this game that we actually have played. At any moment, there's a sensation of fighting to maintain balance. It's too easy to take a wrong turn here or there and fall into the space between spaces and get stuck in electric sheep. Now, you kids are familiar with creepypastas and analog horror, right? Pieces of horror media that feel like they exist just left of reality that threaten to bleed into our realm of experience and actually become something real. Experiences like Petscop, or Ben Drowned, or to stay on theme, MyHouse.Wad. These are pieces of media, games, video, experiences that we engage with but feel haunted by. Like they weren't created necessarily, but instead brought themselves to life, crawling out of the digital primordial waters, forming themselves along the way. MyHouse.Wad in particular is what Infinity reminds me of. Much like House of Leaves, which MyHouse.Wad draws explicit inspiration from, there is a sensation that we are playing through something that was created by a developer but then took on a life of its own. Hidden paths and imagery that reward us if we find them, or are dedicated enough to search through the unsettling horror that awaits within. And that's what Marathon Infinity feels like to me. There are maps that we have to run through, but there's also the in-between states. Electric Sheep 1, 2, and 3. Whatever you please. Eat the path. Nesede Malis, Carol Street Station. Where are monsters in dreams? These feel like interludes where we, the player, not the character, but the player, have slipped through the digital cracks in the game's code and fallen into spaces that we shouldn't necessarily be. And that's honestly the magic of this game. Marathon Infinity feels cursed. It feels oblique and unintelligible, but in the kind of way that we are supposed to be listening to these errors and understand why they've pulled us here. <laughs> of course, Marathon Infinity isn't actually a creepypasta. It is a thoroughly thought out, well-written first-person shooter that demonstrates why Bungie would succeed with story-driven shooters later on in their history. And yet, <sighs> come on, just think about it from this perspective. An unknown developer called Double Lot picks up the reins of the Marathon franchise, and for their first and only game, they make Marathon Infinity. They were supposedly gonna make another game after this, but went under, so they only made one game and then dissolved. And that one game is this cursed little experience called Marathon Infinity. <laughs> like, come on, tell me that doesn't sound like the opening of a creepypasta. I mean, look at this screen. The screen where we get to read about this mysterious Hangar 96. You see this down here, kids? You remember I told you to remember this? That's the fucking Double Lot logo! You can't tell me this isn't legit creepypasta material. You just can't! But in all seriousness, Marathon Infinity it's an excellent game. An excellent game. It returns to the same tight map design as the first marathon with claustrophobic corridors that open up sometimes to mess with you. It provides plenty of ammo and doesn't withhold weapons from you, so the gunplay is much more rewarding this time around than it was in Marathon 2. Here, I felt like I could actually experiment with the arsenal and enjoy the tense cat and mouse experiences these maps have to offer. And it also has that atmosphere of ominous horror lurking behind every moment of the game, like you shouldn't be moving forward, and that you don't know what you're moving forward into, but you know you have to continue on to see it through. This is, honestly, without a doubt, a genuinely exciting game to experience. Now, of course, the story itself and the narrative's methods are going to leave many of you wondering, what the fuck is actually going on? And I get that. I personally didn't need to understand literally everything, but after playing it just once, I felt like I had gotten enough out of it to understand what I needed to understand. And while I could tell that there were some hidden terminals that I clearly had missed, just like with Marathon 1, those terminals felt like they existed to enhance the story, rather than act as mandatory experiences to understand the whole of the plot. That being said, though, 
Infinity does sometimes get in its own way when it comes to communicating story and information the player needs to know. I've already spoken about the terminals where I thought it was Tycho talking to me, but it was actually Admiral Fear. But what about Sabooth? <laughs> I bet you thought I forgot about him. And that's the point. I did forget about him. So I didn't clarify who he was in my analysis earlier because I genuinely did not know who the fuck he was at all. And I'm 99% sure the game doesn't mention him before it mentions him, and I know for a damn fact that it doesn't clarify who he is after he's first mentioned here. Sabuth is the name of a Sfit leader who was referenced all the way back in Marathon 2 as one of the big names of the Sfit clans, specifically the Sfitker clan, and he led them away from the Wan right before the invasion of the Four. Now, since Marathon 2's narrative essentially a Tolkien-esque reading of Sfit genie without stopping to point out which information is relevant and which isn't, I completely forgot about Sabooth, especially since he was mentioned in like a two, maybe three terminals in that game, and out of that 30-odd mission game, like, what are the fucking chances I'm gonna remember that information? And yet, here's Infinity, dropping Sabooth's name like I have all of that info memorized and on call, and that this is a huge moment for him to be returning. Instead, since he's not mentioned in this game prior to that, or his importance is clarified at all, Sabooth feels like yet another name that Marathon drops in front of us like we're supposed to have been taking notes this entire time. And if we weren't, then why are we playing this game? It could be argued that the lack of clarification around Sabooth's role here in Infinity could be purposeful creation of mystery. Like, oh wait, there's this guy returning with this fit? Is he a big deal? Who is he? What do I not know? But I don't think that's the case. There's also terminals in this game where the wording of information is done in such a way that it can be easy to mistake what the game is trying to tell us. For example, the messenger tells us that Admiral Tafir has deployed the Trizeme, and then in practically the same sentence tells us we need to stop him from firing it. Which can be a bit jarring, because just the usage of that word deployed would understandably lead anyone to believe that the weapon has already been fired. I had to read it three times to understand that the weapon was being deployed into position to be fired, and that it had not yet been fired literally. This isn't necessarily bad writing so much as it's just kind of poor word choice, as it makes sense how it is written if you understand what it is trying to say. There's quite a few terminals in this game that are like that, and frankly, I'm glad I went back and went over all of this footage because I didn't understand just how much I didn't understand because of vague wording. For example, I genuinely did not get that the security officer put Durandal's consciousness in his cyborg brain for safekeeping. I did not pick up on that at all. So when Durandal and Toth merged into the messenger, I was so confused as to how that happened. I thought that picking up that circuit board in the pool of water was me finding Durandal, that uh, somebody had placed him there, and that it was fulfilling some kind of weird temporal task. Meanwhile, the communication of picking up and using other circuit boards to activate specific functions in some maps was not really well presented at all. Considering that the other games before this had one, maybe two instances of placing chips and slots for progression, each of which were clearly communicated that I needed to find and place said chips, I didn't understand here that I needed to find these boards and to use them to open up specific access points. These are, in the grand scheme of this game, minor complaints. Minor. Ultimately, while I was confused about what I needed to do, I stumbled my way into figuring out the path in front of me, much like the security guard does. At the end of the day, Marathon Infinity is a well-oiled, tightly designed game with great gunplay, great map design, great story, and really only stumbles here and there. Everything about Marathon 2 that I absolutely hated was done here with much better execution, and it makes me real sad that Marathon 2 couldn't have been this good because, damn, I do love Marathon 1, and I do love Marathon Infinity. In fact, I'm going to give Marathon Infinity an 8.5 out of 10. In every essence, this was such a wonderful surprise. I can't believe I enjoyed this as much as I did. I came here expecting to hate this game, or, at the best, tolerated. And yet, Infinity reached into my brain, stirred everything around, shocked me, confused me, and left me wanting more, just like Marathon 1. And let me tell you kids, I couldn't ask for anything better than that. Thank you all so much for putting up with this excessively long video. I couldn't have done it without you kids and your support through Patreon and YouTube memberships. And if you somehow enjoyed this video and want to see more, there's links in the description to my Patreon. And you get early access for all of my content for only a dollar a month. With that said, stay hydrated. <sighs> oh. <sighs> oh, all right. I can see it, kids. I can see it in your faces. There's something about all of this that's bothering you. You want to know why it was that we had to go through all of these failed timelines watch as the sun and the universe were destroyed over and over again just so that we could restore and salvage one singular timeline. And I think that's a valid question. 
Why not just go back in time to a point where all these timelines splinter off, change the course of events so there's only one primary timeline, saving countless untold billions of lives? Well, the problem with that is the security officer needed to see the failures, needed to see the potential damage and ramifications, gleaning knowledge and understanding of how to prevent this atrocity from happening. Without those failed timelines, there's no creation of a timeline where the work in Kackner is stopped, much like the metaphor of the candle, the wax being burnt, destroyed just to create light. You know the old saying, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. And you know, kids, I think that when we look at it objectively, all of creation is simply an act of destruction.